Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's 6.30, so I think we'll get started. And as I said, we'll let people on as they arrive. Uh, my name is David Steven. I'm gonna be um, one of your facilitators tonight, uh, along with my colleagues um, from Danisco Design. And um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves now. Um, but before I do that, um, we also have our translator with us, Nedalia Alicia Dosala. And she's going to just uh, see if anyone is um, interested in some interpretation services tonight. Sí, hola, buenas noches. Si alguien necesita el servicio de intérprete en español, nos deja saber para que lo podamos conectar a la sala de intérprete. Okay. Thank you, Nedalia. And Nedalia will be with us throughout the evening. So if people come on that, uh, that need interpretation services, we'll be sure to get that set up. Um, so maybe uh, I'll just um, open up to have uh, Donna and her team just do a quick introduction of them, the team, the design sure. team. Sure, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. My name is Donna Danisco, and I'm with Danisco Design. Vivian? Hi, I'm Vivian Lowe, also with Danisco Design. Thank you for making the time to be with us. This is going to be great. Rick? Um, Red Roop. Recording and okay, Rick, we were having trouble hearing you there. Okay, and Rick there Rice, also with this Tedesco, looking forward to having a lively conversation with you all today. Hi, Tim Cooper with Tedesco Design. And Brian Hunter with Tedesco Design. It's good to see everyone here tonight. Okay, great. And Kathy, I guess I'll hand it over to you to say a few words of introduction. Uh, yes, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kathy Shane here in Amherst, not with Danisco Design. I am chair of the elementary school building committee and also on the town council. I'm pinch hitting for Mike uh, Morris, who would normally be introducing this educational workshop because it's about the education curriculum and how it relates to the design of the new school that we're all thrilled um, we're on a pathway to getting. Um, I just wanna mention to people that this is the second workshop and there will be a third on February 17th. And what we're doing tonight is building on years of work in Amherst to envision the type of curriculum, what the priorities are for the curriculum, as well as what is currently in the elementary schools in your programs and program goals. And as you'll see, as David leads you through the workshop, what, what the workshop's goal is to link those priorities um, and have you express any additional ones to the potential design of the school. And this will be part of a document that we have to first bring to the school committee for their vote and signature, and then bring to the granting authority. It's part of the initial feasibility phase as we think through our new school. So I'm just going to turn it over at this point to David, Steve, and Donna who conduct the workshop. And I just want you to know we're taping all of these. We're making them available on our website. Um, so you can go back and listen to what happened at earlier ones. And they're also being conducted with school staff. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kathy. And um, Nedalia, we've had a number of new people join us. So maybe you could make another quick announcement. Sí, hola, buenas noches. Soy la intérprete de español del distrito. Así que si alguien necesita el servicio de intérprete, déjenos saber, por favor, para conectarlos. Okay, great. Thank you. So yes, um, uh, some of you may have joined us in our previous um, meeting, which was uh, dur during the morning. This is gonna be a very similar kind of format to that. Um, we are um, we're gonna be sharing with you uh, some of the highlights of the educational and architectural priorities that are being discussed for the project so far. And we wanna get your feedback on that. So we're going to have an interactive format where we're using a platform called Mentimeter, where you will be through your computer or your phone, you'll be able to, to offer your feedback. Uh, this is anonymous feedback, um, uh, and but we will be able to visually see what people are thinking. I'm going to bring us through um, a, uh, a, a series of slides and we're gonna open up for conversations at different points. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, and I'll tell you about uh, sort of the, the 
agenda for tonight. Uh, first of all, let me just make sure everybody can see my screen. If you can see my screen, can you just give me a, a thumbs up? Okay, great. And um, so it's going to be a little difficult for me to sort of keep my eye on the chat as well as uh, be, be presenting to you all. So, um, but we'll have people focusing on the chat and uh, try to address uh, questions as they come up. Um, so in terms of tonight's uh, agenda, what we'd like to do is give you an overview um, of the visioning process uh, that is part of the MSBA feasibility study uh, for the Amherst Elementary School and talk about some of the sources also of that we've been mining in terms of the, all the, the, um, the priorities that have been established by the district over the last five to six years um, and that we want to revisit, of course, in this situation. Um, we'll be doing some priority goal setting and asking you uh, to give us feedback on your priorities, educational, architectural, community priorities. Uh, we'll be talking some about the key programs of, and learning goals um, of Amherst Elementary Schools, also asking for your feedback on that. And, um, and then we're going to take a break and we're gonna, for 10 minutes and we're going to shift over to talking about design considerations. We call them design patterns. Um, that have also been discussed for the school thus far and share those with you. We're gonna be breaking into small group discussions then to talk further about the design pattern and priorities. Now, if you would rather stay in the larger group and just address any of your questions and concerns for district consideration, that's also an option for when we go into our small group. So, um, so you know, when, when we do that, just, just don't accept the invitation to the small group and there will be a representative from the district and from the design team to discuss any, um, any issues. Now, tonight's meeting is not about site selection. It's not about whether to build new or renovate. We're looking at the educational and architectural priorities that are the high level priorities um, that would be the lenses through we looked at any of those different options and actually the MSBA does require us to look at all of those different options. Um, so in terms of um, new construction, uh, addition, renovation and renovation. And so that's going to be part of the discussion. Now I put in the um, in the chat this link, which is the Amherst uh, School Project. And so you can find there all the materials that we're going to be developing as a result of the notes um, from this presentation, as well as the video um, and, and the presentation itself. So you're going to be able to access that. Um, the design team wants to make this process really as transparent as possible. Um, the, the, the visioning process itself is something that the MSBA requires as, as schools go through the feasibility study um, because they really want districts to take the opportunity to craft their educational vision and a forward thinking vision, connect that to design possibilities, push their thinking forward about what's possible by seeing lots of examples of, of schools that have been designed and built in the last five years, create a set of guiding principles um, and connect that to ideas about key space and adjacencies. And so, you know, the, your district um, has done a lot of thinking about this already. And so we're going to be building upon a number of different um, studies that have been done and, and adding new voices to this conversation. And so those studies are the, the original Amherst Elementary visioning Margaret process. Joined the meeting. That went on uh, in 2015, 2016 for the Wildwood School um, that involved visioning group workshops, community meetings, um, representatives from all three of your elementary schools and the development of, com of a comprehensive set of educational and architectural priorities uh, for ARPS elementary schools. Now that was further developed through the Fort River draft education plan that was developed by the district outlining the learning goals, guiding principles and evolving educational practices within the district that you need to support. Um, and so um, we've also been looking at that as a resource. Um, we also had a study, the TKSP Fort River study, that looked uh, vetted the educational needs and programming that had been established thus far and looked at an evaluation of existing conditions and options for renovation um, uh, on the Fort River site. And finally, we've been looking at your elementary school improvement plan. So all of your schools have improvement plans that talk about the educational priorities 
um, that are that are most important for your school. So we've been looking at those as well, and we'll be reviewing some of those in just a moment. Um, so this is all for the purpose of adding to and further developing your narrative. Um, now, we want to help the district optimize the MSBA space template and align uh, this vision to your educational plan as it moves forward. Of course, it's very important to reach teachers and talk to teachers. We had a workshop yesterday, an after school voluntary workshop for teachers, and we're going to be conducting focus groups with them. We also have really been trying to be very sensitive about the, the stresses on your teachers right now, on your educators uh, due to Omicron and all that goes along with that. Um, so, so we're gonna try and reach them wherever we can, get their feedback and add their, add their uh, voices to the conversation. Of course, that's extremely important. Um, we're gonna do a little review of some of the priorities that have been established and ask for your feedback on that. But I wanted before that to just say that as we look at a renovation or a new school or a renovation addition um, uh, for this project, any MSBA project is gonna have certain things. So um, ADA will definitely, you will be ADA compliant. We'll be looking at safety and security features. We'll be looking at thermal comfort, including cooling. We see buildings as year round buildings, of course. Um, this comes along with modern technology and furniture. We know that classrooms need to be well sized because it's not just a more, you, there may be more traditional delivery going on, but there also may be lots of small group things going on in a classroom. And those classrooms need natural light. Um, we know that we'll be looking at how to maximize connections to your site and that indoor connectivity. We'll be looking at special education delivery and how to um, make sure that it happens in the most seamless uh, way possible. And we'll be looking at safe drop off and pick up. Sustainability we know is incredibly important to your district. And, um, and we'll be looking um, uh, to make sure there are an adequate number of distributed bathrooms and gender neutral bathrooms as well. So those are some of the things that any renovated or new MSBA school uh, will include. So this is really an opportunity, especially at this phase of doing the high level visioning to be very aspirational in your thinking uh, about what you would like to see both educationally and architecturally uh, for this building. And we want to be thinking about really making sure that, um, that uh, this is going to be a building that's going to last you for decades to come and that can evolve with changes um, along, along the way. So um, we have a large group here, so it's going to be difficult to do, um, to do a whole group uh, sort of introduction. But what I wanted to do is to just maybe if people feel comfortable turning on their, um, this works much better when we turn on our monitors for just a moment. If people could turn on their monitors and then we can see, um, we'd like to just sort of like, you know, get a, get a check in here about who's, who's, in the, who's in the room. And so I'll just give people a moment to do that. All right, so um, do we have school administrators here? If you're a school administrator, please, please wave to the group. All right, hi, Tammy. Um, and what about teachers? Do we have teachers with us tonight? If you're teaching in the system, can you wave to the group? All right, no teachers tonight. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get the we're gonna get to those teachers. Uh, we're gonna do focus groups within their schedule at the school. Um, parents, what about parents? I'm sure a lot of you are parents of students that have either, and that includes parents that are uh, maybe of students that have already gone through the system. All right. How and community members? I'm assuming that we've got mostly community members here. Uh, many people wear many hats. Uh, school committee members. Do we have school committee members with us? Any school committee? All right. How about um, community partners that are like work for agencies within Amherst and, um, and partner with the school district or with youth development? Okay. Any town officials? People on boards or, okay. Well, so what I wanna do now is I wanna give people an opportunity to um, sort of share, we're gonna be doing a bunch of priority setting, but I wanna give people an opportunity to share their greatest hope for this project. 
And so we're gonna do this by going to a platform called Mentimeter. If you wanna do it on your phone, just use this QR code here and put your camera on it. Or you can go to menti.com um, and type in this number and you're gonna to get to this page. So I'm gonna keep give people just a moment to do that. And in, in uh, thank you for uh, adding into the chat that there are lots of special education families here too. So we really are, are thrilled to have you with us here tonight. So um, yeah, you can see down, someone already did it. There's a heart down at the bottom in the right-hand corner. If you get to that page, you can press on that heart. That'll let us know that you've reached there. Great. All right. So um, each of the pages that I go to where I'm gonna be asking for feedback will have this code up at the top if you lose it for any reason, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to go to a slide here, um, which is just asking you to share your greatest hope for the Amherst Elementary School project. Um, that could be a hope that connects to educational or architectural ideas or um, its place in the community. Um, so we're just gonna open up for a few minutes to do that. And we do have a lot to cover tonight. So, um, so I'm gonna keep us moving along um, and we will save time at the end for Q and A and we will be going into our small groups. And for those people that might have just entered um, in the last uh, five minutes, I did mention that we're going to be going into small groups to talk about um, design patterns and design ideas. But for those people that would like to stay in the larger group and talk about big picture issues or concerns about the project uh, with a district representative, you're welcome to stay in the large group and there will be a half hour for doing that at the end. So we'll, we'll save our questions for them. All right, so we can see these things coming up on, on our screen. So uniting around shared goals, making sure we can get it done. Finally build a school building that's healthy, light-filled and joyful. Preserving and enhancing everything you love about your child's school now. Yeah, we know that that change is difficult and we certainly wanna give you something that's going to be um, a, a joyful and, and, and safe and um, and, uh, and personalized environment. Um, developing broadest community support, climate resiliency as a hub for the town. And that's certainly something that teachers have mentioned and others have mentioned as part of a curricular piece as well. Place where children can thrive, minimal strife in the community on the shortest possible timeline. Um, Advising, advising it's enroll, revising the enrollment policy to allow siblings of students. Okay, we're gonna be, so what we're gonna be doing is all of these notes, we're gonna consolidate them. Uh, we're gonna see all the themes that have emerged, but they will all be part of the, um, the consolidated set of notes. Okay, so a lot about, you know, people coming together to, to come to an agreement about what's gonna be best. Uh, for, for the kids um, and a transparent and honest process. And I know that your certainly your architectural team is very committed to doing that. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving along here. There'll be more opportunities to share more specific priorities. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the future ready learning goals and programs that have been highlighted in the ed plan that we as designers are gonna be taking into consideration. So, um, so there's a set of, of future ready learning goals um, that was established by the district. Um, right up at the top is empathy and citizenship um, and, um, and being students feeling part of a flex of, of community uh, that is, is self-aware, that they're having social, the, that the building and the program sort of facilitates social interaction. Also supporting curiosity, creativity and risk taking. Uh, sparking people's imaginations, um, supporting collaboration. Uh, that's an, a, a, a recurring theme. Cultural awareness and expression. So sort of multicultural liter literacy and global awareness and effective oral and written communication. So these are some of the things that have been established. Um, there are also 
guiding principles for design from the ed plan um, that connect to these. And these are the big picture kind of priorities, excitement and engagement, um, a building for the community and that builds community, a building that's adaptable and flexible and can evolve over time and, um, and fostering collaboration and sharing of expertise and allowing teachers to work together in, in teams in meaningful ways so that they can better serve your, your children. So now we're gonna open up for you all to share some of your priorities. And I'm going to, um, we have three different slides and I'll share one slide first on each of these different categories to show you some of the things that have come up already. And then I'm gonna open it up for you to share. Um, now we're gonna start out with educational priorities. And some of the things that have been highlighted are certainly supporting future ready 21st century learning, social justice and diversity programming we know is incredibly important, equitable use and access of this building, supporting diverse learning needs and special education programs and delivery, um, and the dual language program that we know is extremely important at, and, and, and a, a big part of the, of the Fort River programming at this point. Um, and the district's programming. So additionally, social emotional learning, your restorative justice practices, the, the uh, delivery of more interdisciplinary project-based hands-on student-centered learning, lots of different words here that may sound like educational jargon, but these are things that districts around the Commonwealth and around the country are thinking about. Um, maker spaces, art and music programming, which we know are extremely important to you all. So, um, I'm going to open up now for a few minutes for people still on that same mentee um, uh, code 5573500. Oh, so I'm going to open up for you to share your educational goals. Now we're going to have an opportunity to share architectural goals. So if you're thinking about collaboration being important, maybe you, would, you wouldn't talk so much about collaborative spaces here as you would about um, collaborative programming. So we're really thinking about the educational piece right now, but we know they're all very connected. Okay, so support for neurodiversity and inclusion, mental health, um, that definitely connects to the idea of universal design for learning and an inclusive curriculum. We've learned a lot the last few years about increasing outdoor education opportunities and the importance of those outdoor connections. Um, it's hard to articulate most important goals in a few seconds. Um, okay, well, so that's actually, and I want to, I'm glad someone said that because um, this is not the end of the conversation. And you can certainly, um, we have a link at the end. Um, Debbie Westmoreland, your district communication director is going to be the sort of the, the person um, who will continue to take comments. So um, we will have this presentation at the link that I included in the chat. Um, and we will also um, uh, have the tape of this. Um, and so as you think of new things, you can certainly reach out and we will include that in the information that we're collecting. So thanks for pointing that out. So curriculum that can challenge every student at their level, diverse learning across the spectrum, maker spaces and music are critical. Mm -hmm. And we know that that's important to the district. Um, supporting social emotional development of students. That has a lot to do with sort of a building that really supports both small learning communities and the sense of being connected to the larger whole and outdoor educational opportunities, uh, bilingual and dual language programming, access to music and arts, experiential education, uh, and a sensory gym that allows for neurodiverse children to attend better in their classrooms. Okay, great. 
and curriculum that prepares our children for what the world will look like when they're in charge of it. And that's certainly something as we think about these future ready learning goals, which we'll be discussing in just a moment, that's, that's kind of the point of it all. Um, I'm gonna move on to architectural priorities and uh, some of the ones that have been, uh, that have been highlighted so far. Um, so a, a, a space that's inspiring and warm and promotes a feeling of belonging, universal design for learning, supporting all kinds of learning. So quiet, noisy, small, large, traditional, project-based, um, and that has a lot to do with also the ease of wayfinding through the building, a building that's practical and comfortable, um, safe and welcoming, uh, flexible spaces. And we certainly look at a lot of our big ticket spaces as being multi-purpose and multi-use, uh, community building, um, connecting to the whole, as well as these small learning communities and display throughout the building, posting student work, celebrating student work and room to expand if needed. So those are some of the ones that have been established so far. Um, and here we're opening up for you to share your top architectural priorities. I will say natural light is something that we think about a lot. Um, it's certainly connected to sustainability, but it's also connected to health and wellness and, um, and connections to nature. So well-built and not costly um, to maintain. Definitely child-oriented design, so thinking about scale, and and we know you know there's a range. Kids kids really uh, vary in size um, along along the elementary spectrum, so we want to be thinking about uh, age-appropriate scale, um, adequate space for not only storage. That is not mundane at all. That's one of the bigger things: the storage that we're thinking about a lot um, because. If you're doing more project-based, especially, or hands-on learning or, or neurodiverse learning, you need space for storing a lot of equipment. And I will say that all MSBA classrooms now are required to have two sinks so that they can support uh, that kind of more project-based learning. So connections to the outdoors, um, considering no more than two floors to minimize the need for using elevator. Yep, um, open spaces for gathering, uh, contain spaces for day-to-day -day learning, no open classrooms. So we know that you have been living in open school environments. So, and that's really challenging. It's really challenging acoustically. And so um, when we look at more kind of connect, the, the benefits of that is that you've got sort of connectivity, right? And so, or more um, opportunities for teaming. So we're gonna try and take the best of that, but give you doors or, or you know, openings that can close and that you can have that uh, acoustic privacy and visual privacy when you need it. Safe and secure real walls that go from the floor to the ceiling, um, interactive net zero system. So we'll look at the whole idea of building as teacher, um, light, happy, comfortable, not institutional, sustainable, a common space where children can all come together, space for outdoor recreation, great. Um, natural air circulation, um, fewer blue rooms, instead more room, more accessible rooms for all, good sound, performance. Um, okay, open classrooms are no longer a thing in, um, in Wildwood and, and Fort River, okay. Um, materials that are easy to maintain, security features, air conditioning, and COVID and other airborne virus safe building. Yeah, and one of the things we think about um, related to the pandemic is how do we use every square inch of the building so that we can spread out in terms of, um, in terms of social distancing if needed, uh, but also just to be have really practical and get the, your biggest bang for the buck. Ventilation, minimize the spread of COVID, um, not too loud hand dryers, okay, and secure entrances. Okay, we're gonna keep going to community priorities um, as related to, now one of the things is that, you know, since 
your older buildings were designed, we're definitely thinking about schools as community resources and community centers that are used after hours and on weekends. So safe community use and access um, to key spaces and multi use those big ticket spaces like your cafetorium or your or your library or your gym. Um, we also want to promote family and community engagement, um, establishing clear goals for community support is something that has, has been mentioned many times, um, connecting related service providers and providing spaces for them, environmentally sustainable and green building, um, which we know is a community-wide initiative, and connected to that, the idea of the building itself as a, as a teacher. Okay, so I'm going to now give you an opportunity to share your community priorities. Okay, so outdoor bathroom, so after hours playground use is welcoming for families, um, connecting to public transport, outdoor spaces, open to families, safe travel, community access, um, live our equity and diversity values by encouraging a new building that will allow for multi-purpose use by the community as appropriate accessible gathering spaces, utilization for community events and celebrations, keeping taxes at a minimum, uh, a picnic area that can use, be used by families as well as students during lunch, inclusive playground for children of all abilities, uh, can continue to be used for elections, site selection could, should consider how the town might use the other site, um, okay. Um, green space outdoors again, increasing home values, playgrounds open to all, a community garden. Yeah, your teachers were definitely talking about that yesterday. A meeting space for community groups, places for performances and sports and shared resources, like a pool or rehearsal space, um, ways to connect with nature and outdoors. Safety, but also a sense of openness. Yeah, that's that kind of it, idea of safety and welcome is something that we're going to be really thinking about. A lot of it is, um, first of all, uh, sort of more um, kind of creating a gateway mechanism where you tightly control how people get into the building, but it doesn't need to feel like you're, you know, you're getting frisked or anything when you come in. Um, but a lot of visual access as well, um, but active and passive measures for safety. Um, and, and that can definitely align with a sense of openness. Um, okay, so it's important to understand what we all know and understand to be the defini definition of community, and it varies among and across so many groups that we might get off on, that we get off on the wrong track and take us down the wrong path, okay? Um, it meets school committee policies and school facilities use, space for community gatherings on the weekend, speedy project completion. Yeah, we spent a lot of time in this town with people putting up roadblocks. So we want to make sure that this moves along. Um, consider locking doors near voting areas for election days. Yeah, one of the one of the elements of, of uh, promoting community access in a new or renovated school is providing sort of a community core or set of spaces that have adjacencies to each other, but that can be locked off from the rest of the building. So we're gonna be really thinking about how that access happens in very safe ways. Okay, included sports fields, getting the job done. 
um, and CPAC would like to see social and academics connections being made uh, to disabled peers and spaces that help facilitate that. Um, capitalizing on the school complex in existence where Wildwood is, knowing we need to rebuild the middle and high schools next. Okay. Adequate parking without negative traffic impact. Safety for entering the building, but also easy access to and through the outside spaces. Okay. Ease of access for parking and drop off. And we're going to definitely be thinking about safe drop off and pick up in terms of access to the site. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make a shift here and I wanna share with you some of the ideas about future ready teaching and learning that, that the district has been highlighting in its education plan uh, and its school improvement plans. Um, so we know that the district is really committed to um, providing students with a high quality education and that um, that the multi-ethnic, multicultural, and pluralistic focus is really strong, uh, looking for equity for all students and making sure that students feel respected and, and learn to respect others. Um, so we looked at these future ready learning goals from the ed plan, and they very much align with um, other things or things that other school networks are thinking about. And one of the things, um, one of the sets of future ready learning goals that is most, I think, well known um, is are the five C's that were that were coined by the 21st century, the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. Um, and these are all higher order thinking skills that, you know, they're they were every bit as important in the 20th century and the 19th century, but they have particular Im impact uh, when we think about um, giving kids the skills to be really proactive learners, to develop confidence in themselves as learners, um, and to learn to, to learn that whole notion of lifelong learning. So um, it's it's so when we think about critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and citizenship, these are all sort of um, similar to the future ready learning goals that were developed and have been developed by the district. Um, a lot of those C's are in there, and those C's are really baked into next-gen science standards and next-gen MCAS. They're really part of sort of the conversation that's going on in most schools. Um, how do we um, make sure that we're giving kids mastery of core academic content, but also focusing on these higher order thinking skills? So connected to that um, is the, the idea that we may have more traditional delivery still going on, but we also want to be getting more and more student centric. Learning is becoming and should be more active. Um, that's not, you know, it's, it's varied. Sometimes it's going to be in more traditional delivery. Other times it's more active and project based. Environments need to then be flexible. Uh, they need to evolve to be uh, able to support sort of whole class instruction or small group instruction or independent work. Technology should be seamless and available where you want it, when you want it, not necessarily an end in and of itself, but a tool uh, that is, is available um, and is ubiquitous. Um, and we're looking at one-to-one -one technology now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, we maybe have many, many devices on hand that we don't even know about. Um, we're looking at collabor supporting collaborative learning, recognizing that we also still need to have spaces where students can focus and where they can be quiet. Um, so we have collaborative environments and quiet environments, subject-based delivery and project-based delivery. So the key is really variety of spaces and adjacencies to support a wide variety of delivery uh, mechanisms. And this is all, again, connected to not only your district learning goals, uh, but what the World Economic Forum in their top 10 skills of 2025 um, has coined the skills for engaged citizenship and a new economy. So when we talk about preparing kids for uh, the world of work and future learning, um, what a lot of people are thinking about are the skills that you learn applying the content you're learning um, in active ways and the ability to um, be adaptable in your thinking to learn and unlearn things. So I'm now going to share 
the um, focus areas that have been highlighted in the, um, in the ed plan by the district, I have 12 slides. And after that, I'm going to allow you the or give you the opportunity to um, tell us what's missing and what's most important to you. Um, and also to look at each of these and share with us what's most important to you. So I'm gonna go briefly through, through these. They all are highlighted in your education plan. And as a design team, we wanna make sure to really fully understand what they mean to the district and to your school. So um, a social justice and multiculturalism, uh, a curriculum that emphasizes that um, and um, is, is sort of key and, um, and so culturally sustaining learning experiences and connected to that, the idea of climate justice. And so when we think about buildings being teaching tools um, and helping students be good shepherds of the environment, that's, that's definitely uh, connected to that. Now, each of your schools have core values and mission. Um, and these all actually have implications for how we think about creating community through the way that we uh, design a building and, and develop connections. Um, so we'll be thinking about those core, those core values and, and your mission very much around respect and empathy um, and feeling a part of the community and engaging families from the community in equitable ways. Universal Design for Learning um, has educational and architectural sort of meaning. Um, so on the educational uh, side, we're really thinking about that neurodiversity and working with students um, and, and nurturing and challenging them according to their individual strengths and needs. So to do that, we want to give them opportunities to interact with curriculum and information, represent and express what they know and engage with it in a variety of ways um, that could be hands on. Um, and that involve the opportunities for action and expression. Um, and, and this definitely means that we need to be thinking about learning environments that can, um, that can adapt to a lot of different um, delivery methods. And that differentiated instruction um, and tiered intervention, uh, which, is, um, which is really core to that uh, process of meeting kids where they're at um, is, does imply that oftentimes there's co-teaching going on in a classroom or multiple adults that are in a classroom. So that's something that's very different than the way we've, you know, we, we've, um, we've seen school done um, in, in, past, in past decades. So we need to think about classes uh, that are supporting potentially multiple adults and thinking about the spaces outside of classes classrooms uh, that might be comfortable for doing more small targeted intervention work. Now we know your dual language program, your Caminantes program um, is, is something that people are very excited about. And um, we'll be talking um, to you all and to your teachers and the district about how to best um, locate this within the new building in terms of how to fully integrate it uh, within the new building. And, um, and support the program as it grows. Social emotional learning is uh, something that uh, a lot of schools are thinking about. This connects to the idea of growth mindset and um, the development of persistence and resilience and grit. Um, and it connects to just general ideas about mental health um, and responsible decision-making being part of a, a democratic community um, and, um, and building your relationship skills. Family and community engagement um, is very important to the district. So building community connections, um, really fostering parental involvement, leveraging the resources of the community um, and adults as mentors. And um, when we think about project-based learning, that really connects to the idea of the community itself as, as kind of text. And that's very engaging and motivating for kids to feel like what they're doing has real meaning uh, beyond, uh, beyond just the confines of their classroom. So that kind of relevant and engaged learning where uh, students uh, might be doing projects, they might be creating products that have some tangible value um, and um, they are establishing adult world connections 
And this implies also that there would be different methods of assessment. So we think about presentation spaces and, um, and exhibition and display um, as being part of this. And this is something that um, each of your schools have said to us that they're in the process of, you know, really kind of developing more fully and that it's really important to them. And so interdisciplinary and project-based learning, um, how to connect uh, sort of as, as teaching teams, um, how to collaborate um, in uh, professional learning communities and providing a context for that um, is something that, um, that this is connected to. And health and wellness, just general movement opportunities for mental and physical fitness, uh, varied context for learning, um, outdoor connections, age appropriate play opportunities and movement opportunities. And I think we're getting to the end here, uh, STEM and STEAM. So this is something that a lot of schools that are thinking about, science, technology, engineering, and math. And then in STEAM, we're adding the arts or arts and humanities to that. So this is really a kind of like a cross-discipline approach that's very engaging um, because it involves a lot of hands-on and project-based learning. And many schools are putting in uh, STEM and STEAM uh, programming and actually the MSBA provides space to do that in a science technology engineering lab. Um, and so that's something that um, we're definitely gonna be thinking about. And this is the last one, your Amherst Integrated Arts Initiative. Um, we know that your arts and performing arts and visual arts programs are all very important. We're gonna be looking at um, really centrally locating these programs within the school environment so that they're easy to access um, and, um, and also supporting uh, before school and after school programming that connects to that, um, as well as uh, sort of community art. Um, so, so that's a lot. Uh, and we're going to take a break in just a minute. Um, but uh, I have one slide here, which uh, just allows you to kind of give us uh, your first shot at, you know, what are the things of these, of these 12 uh, programs that have been highlighted in uh, your district ed plan as, in, as per of particular importance, what are the things that, um, that are most exciting for you? Um, and then I have a slide after this uh, where we can share what's missing and what, what you'd like us to know um, uh, about the programs that are most important to you, if, especially if we haven't mentioned them. So the, if you go to Mentee, and go to uh, this code again, 5373500. You will get to this slide and you should be able to scroll down and just um, choose the ones that uh, you're most excited about. And we'll just see a, a graph that kind of emerges here. And that's not to say that all of these aren't important. They have been established as key priorities by the district, but um, just always interesting to, to see uh, from a community perspective uh, what people are most excited about. So social justice and multiculturalism right up at the top, um, at least so far. Um, and then social emotional learning and differentiated instruction. Many of these are really connected as well. 
uh, that kind of differentiation as connected to interdisciplinary and project-based learning um, is very is very key. Just take another minute or two here, and uh, but then we do have another slide where you can share other programs that we have not mentioned here that are of particular uh, importance to you and your families. Okay, so I, I'm going to open up for this here, and what I will do, we're going to take a break after this, uh, but what I'd like to do is also just invite people to if you would like to verbally, you've been listening to me talk for a long time now. If you would like to share some of your thinking about this, we would really welcome that. We can have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, and then we're gonna get to take a, a, a break, um, a, a 15 minute break and uh, come back and talk some about architectural ideas. Yeah, we've heard this before, the Spanish instruction for all elementary kids in the district, not, not just those in Caminantes. Mm -hmm. And music, learning that doesn't involve devices. So, mm -hmm. um, and I will say that a lot of, a lot of schools uh, that we see now, especially elementary schools are, are really trying to create some technology free zones within the school um, and really promote um, much more targeted use of technology when uh, as, as a tool when needed. An interactive curriculum that teaches the students about climate change and energy conservation and environmentalism. Mm -hmm. And then looking at neurodiversity to be included in diversity. Okay, so that needs a more direct um, sort of less implied and more direct. Okay, communication skills, oral and written. We don't want great thinkers and analysts who can't communicate their ideas. Yep. Preschool, aftercare programs, understanding the global community, more arts instruction that crosses disciplines. Okay, the arts was cut by 20% this year, so we need to restore that cut and expand. Uh-huh. Climate change is a major priority. Um, use weekly technology classes for more hands-on project-based exploration. Engagement with elderly in the community, so multi-age spaces that are family-friendly. Per family survey, more room for teacher-generated instruction, tech-free zone, literacy-rich, numeracy-rich. Okay, these are great. Okay, great. All right. Um, I don't hear anybody turning off their mics to, to do any sharing. Would anyone like to share any of their ideas about um, some of these? Okay, well, it's 7.25. We're gonna take a 15 minute break and we're gonna come back at 7.40. And at that time, um, I'm gonna leave this slide up so you can put more on it if you want. Um, and we'll come back at, at 7.40 and we're gonna shift over to talking about some ideas about um, architectural design and, um, and approaches. Okay, thank you.
Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to get started again. Um, we're going to, uh, we have another hour and 20 minutes. And within that time, um, I'm going to spend about 20, 25 minutes talking about some uh, design approaches that have been discussed uh, for the school, whether it's a renovation or uh, a renovation addition or new construction. Um, these we call these design patterns, and so we want to we want to share them with you, get your feedback on them. We're going to then be breaking into some small discussion groups that will be hosted by our design team members, and at which time you'll have a chance to talk in more depth and get any of your questions answered about these design patterns, and um, and and talk about which ones uh, are are your biggest priorities or that you're most excited about. At that time, we will also have an option if you would prefer not to go into a smaller group, but stay behind in the larger group and stay with a design team member and a representative from the district to talk about just general considerations or questions you have about the project. So we have those two options uh, towards the, uh, the latter part um, of this. I'm gonna share my screen again. And Ryan, I just want to make sure that we're still recording, right? Okay, very good. All right. So um, what we'd like to do now is just talk about some ideas about things that we think about in general when we design future ready schools. Uh, that can support varied delivery and that help to build community um, and that are warm and inviting places. Um, I'm going to share. I'm going to share 18 different what we call design patterns or approaches that have been prioritized uh, within the Ed Plan and that have been discussed at different points along the way um, as we think about the school project. Um, I want what I do want to say is that. It's the concept, not the details. So if you see um, a picture that has colors that you don't like or materials that you don't like, um, try to get beyond that to the concept that's being discussed because these are just, we're showing you some examples, but there are many ways to, uh, to approach these different patterns. Um, so as I said, there are 18 patterns and the first six of them uh, we're calling givens. These are, these are things that at the beginning of um, uh, this presentation, I mentioned that any new or renovated school uh, through the MSBA process will be considering. Um, and I just wanted to um, give you some illustrations of them and talk a little bit more about them. So um, one of them is this concept of welcoming arrival, which, which also connects to safe drop off and pick up. Um, but when we think about welcoming arrival for a building, we want to make sure that one, we know where to enter the building. Um, two, uh, there's a clear entry sequence that has good visibility to and from the building so that we can see or people in the building can see who is approaching the building. Um, this is also connected to security when you get to the doors of the building. But before that time, there might be places to sit outside uh, where parents, when they're dropping off their kids, can uh, talk to each other and chat. Um, or there may be uh, places that are protected from the weather, from the rain or snow, um, if the doors to the building aren't open yet. So we want to be thinking about that, um, that welcoming arrival connected to uh, safe drop off and pick up. Uh, greeting, gating, gatekeeping and security. So any school is going to have a gatekeeping system. Um, it's been mentioned a number of times, when, especially in our meeting with the teachers yesterday, that people don't want this to feel like they're entering a jail or that it's an institution. They want it to feel warm and welcoming. So we will definitely be keeping that in mind. Um, simply in terms of the active security measures, there's a gatekeeping mechanism where the door, you have to get buzzed in to a set of doors um, and, um, and there's visual access to whoever is coming into the building. Um, so. So in this uh, Zervis School in Newton, and these are all MSBA projects that I'm sharing with you right now that have been designed and built in the last five years. Um, at the Zervis School, uh, we've got, um, once you enter in, there's a, it's also your first impression of the building. So um, what do you see? Well, you see uh, easily into the main office, which is over here, or the cafetorium. 
There's work on display on the walls um, and also a, a flat screen monitor um, that talks about the life of the school. There's comfortable places to sit um, and it's a bright open space. Um, and here at the Cabot School, which is a renovation of a school in Newton, um, there's a, a nice low counter with a friendly face um, that, uh, that houses the administrative offices um, or some part of the administrative offices. So um, there's a sense of warm entry and greeting that's connected to security. Again, we're talking right now about the six givens that any new or renovated school is going to be taking into account. Uh, flexible classrooms, they're still your basic building block of any school. Uh, we wanna make sure there's good natural light. We know that that really, and good ventilation. Um, modular furniture that is easy to move, uh, but sturdy enough to withstand uh, student, uh, student interactions um, that where you can work individually or work as groups. We wanna be thinking about storage, robust technology, um, maybe places within this, uh, and in this uh, slide right here, you can see there's a little nook right here uh, where students can sit. That's a nice place to, like, if you need to kind of like de-escalate or calm down or just have a quiet space to read, you can go into that space. We want to be thinking about storage for books as well around the perimeter. And you can see here, there's some good closets for storage. And as I mentioned before, any MSBA uh, um, uh, is going to have two sinks within its elementary school classrooms. Uh, engaged outdoor play. Um, now this is also connected to the idea of outdoor connections and connections to nature. That's another design pattern, but this is, a, a, you, can, you see here more um, of these paved surfaces and sort of uh, play environments. So we're gonna be thinking about um, how, how age appropriate play um, is connected to the use of the site and easy access to classrooms. And sustainability, looking at active and passive measures. Um, any MSBA school is gonna be looking at mass chips or LEED certification and looking at you know, the degree to which the, the, also the community would like to work towards uh, a net zero building using passive and active measures and make that whole process kind of an interactive one in terms of the way the building uh, is interacted with, with in students and teachers. So those are six of the givens of the design patterns. Um, and now we have 12 more that we're gonna share that are a little bit more. Yes, we're gonna be considering them in, and these are things that have been already highlighted by the district as things that are important to them. Um, wayfinding and streetscapes uh, really connects to the idea of universal design for learning and being able to people of all abilities, being able to easily navigate the building to know where they are. So how can we do that um, through use of color and texture and light and graphics um, can help you move through the building. And that you'll see here, th these schools have lockers and cubbies, but just not in places in these, in these images that you can see. Um, but these are streetscapes that, um, that people are making their way through, good natural light, oftentimes borrowed light coming in, um, but also showcasing things along the way, or maybe creating places where the hallway is wider, there are nodes for seating, uh, for small group work that might be connected to a classroom neighborhood or views in and out of, um, of, of adult offices, adults modeling um, uh, uh, collaboration that's going on and also um, work on display. So wayfinding and streetscapes. You're asking what is borrowed light. Oh, okay, someone asked what borrowed light was. So borrowed light um, is light getting light into the interior of the building. So as we build, you can see that there is, um, in this particular uh, image right here, these are not windows to the exterior of the building, but those exterior windows that are within this space in here are letting borrowed light come through into the center of the building. This building happens to have some very nice uh, sawtooth skylights in it as well that are lighting that. But we're, as we think about borrowed light, that connects to um, the idea of where do we build in transparency in appropriate ways so that we can have informal supervision uh, throughout the school, but also connectivity between the adults and the students, um, or views into interesting things that are going on in your STEAM lab, for instance, or in your art room, 
Um, so, so that is all. Those are also places where we can get borrowed light as we as we put uh, controlled transparency in. Uh, this uh, is a design pattern of classroom neighborhoods, and the idea here is that it's no extra square footage, but is it's looking at the adjacencies between spaces in a way that creates synergy between those spaces and gives you a variety of opportunities for uh, delivery. So in this image, which is at the Zervis School in Newton, um, this central area, which is what you see in the plan down here, is a flexible project-based learning area that is at the center of a collection of four classrooms. And a small. there's also a small group room and a pullout space. So here you have sort of collaborative environments, small group environments, and your classroom environments. And there's a good bit of transparency here. You can see there's a lot of borrowed light. Now we know that in a lockdown situation, we need to be able to pull a blind down. All of these rooms have areas of refuge within the classroom. Um, so, but what you have here is a classroom neighborhood. This could be a grade level classroom neighborhood. We also know that sometimes there are bubbles, there are more kids in one year than another. We don't wanna get locked into a certain size of pods, but we can think about how to co-locate classrooms in a way that creates a neighborhood. It's a sense of place, it's a sense of belonging for students, and it's a way to create a really small learning community within the larger community of the school. Another pattern, um, looking at breakout and pullover spaces. So one of the things that uh, we know uh, through, uh, through DESE, the um, uh, Department of uh, Education, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, we are taking an approach towards special education delivery where you will certainly get occupational therapy, physical therapy, sensory rooms. They will be in a certain part of the building that may be more private, but we also want to build in breakout and pullover spaces in the form of breakout rooms where you can close a door or maybe nooks or areas in the hallway, extended learning areas next to classrooms. And that allows you to do targeted intervention and enrichment in close proximity to your classrooms. So um, DESE really wants to see this distributed throughout the school. And the good news is that there's a lot of square footage um, that is now through the MSBA template that is uh, that is put towards delivery of seamless special education and enrichment services. Connected to that is this design pattern of extended learning spaces. So in any given school, and you have these open plan schools, so not so much in, in Fort River or, uh, or Wildwood, but where you have hallways, that's taking up 30% of your square footage that goes unused most of the time. So um, the MSBA is definitely interested in, especially as we think about environments being fully wired with technology um, and, um, and being able to create areas where students can do small group work and get targeted intervention in close proximity to their classrooms. So thinking about, can we widen the hallway in certain areas so that there are paths of travel, but there's also areas for students to work. You can see this um, at the at the Herd Wyman Elementary School here. This is defined by a bank of lockers here, but you've got some areas right outside connected to two or three different classrooms in close proximity, where um, where para paraprofessionals or um, or can work with small groups, or teachers can bring classes outside. Here at the Ivan Smith Elementary, the whole hallway has been widened to about 16 feet, and there are areas outside of classroom where you can do that kind of uh, pullover work or small group work. A lot of schools are thinking about collaborative environments. So those breakout spaces I do want to mention too are spaces where we can get quiet because we need spaces where kids can focus. Um, so here's some other examples of collaborative environments. In this case, um, at the Ivan Smith School, we've got uh, one of these learning stairs that's a great venue for uh, presentation and either formal or informal presentation and just group gatherings, community building. This is right outside the learning commons and you the library learning commons. And you can see that this is a glass wall here that can be completely opened up or it can be closed for acoustic purposes, but you still have that visible connectivity. Um, and here at the Clyde Brown Elementary, you can see also outside of the art room, an area that's a project room 
um, located uh, right next to a, a teacher planning area so that there's informal supervision and surveillance happening there as well. But these are areas that you can spill out of the classroom. Certainly on the elementary school level, supervision is very important. We always need, we know we're gonna, we wanna give kids the opportunity, especially older kids to practice being more independent, but, but we know that we have to have eyes on, um, eyes on the street at all times. Cafetoriums um, are definitely something that you will have in your school. Well, you could have a, a gymnatorium. The, the MSBA does not support auditoriums in elementary schools. But you can see from these cafetoriums here that they're very pleasant multi-purpose spaces. Uh, they have really good acoustics. They have stages with full lighting and audio visual. Um, and, um, and so they're great multi-purpose spaces that can be used for as a community hub. Uh, and we're really looking at all of these spaces like the cafeteria, the library, and the gym to serve multi-purposes and not so when, when, when this is not being used for food service, it's being used for uh, extended learning environments. This is also a great resource for the community and many schools use this as something to generate revenue by renting out this space at different points. Now the Media Center Learning Commons, um, it's very important that we still have tactile books and, and storage for books and access to books, but we're also looking at this area as performing multiple functions. Um, there's generally an area for more quiet focus work and an area for more collaborative work um, or for more kind of uh, presentations and, um, and, and group uh, sort of um, collaboration. Um, in this here, the Gibbs Middle School, you can see this is a renovation um, and this is a sixth grade um, program uh, where we've got a project-based learning mezzanine and a STEM STEAM lab that's connected to the library. Um, and, um, and there are also areas for more traditional kind of work and focus work and interactive work. This is often the place too where professional development happens for teachers. STEM and STEAM and maker spaces, as I mentioned, the MSBA template has a science, technology and engineering um, room built in. Um, this is one example at the Jacobs Elementary in New Bedford where their STEAM lab um, is a program that all students twice a week um, ha have access to this space. And it's simply lots of big table surfaces and tables on wheels so that we can spread out and do projects, good storage for engineering kits along the perimeter. Um, in this situation, they've got a garage door that opens directly out onto a roof deck. And that roof deck has planters and weather stations. It also connects to the art room that's uh, immediately adjacent. Um, and here you can see in this maker space, uh, flexible furniture, lots of storage. And, and so just a great hands-on um, space and venue. Uh, another design pattern, that of innovation hubs. This is the, um, the Bourne Intermediate Elementary School in Cape Cod. And what they did here is uh, they took a lot of the sort of those big ticket spaces like the library learning commons, the art room, their STEM or innovation studio. They created an outdoor classroom and here's their music room and they co-located them in what they call the innovation hub, uh, which is also accessible after hours. It's where and it's where um, after school programming happens. So it's a really nice kind of uh, again, you get this synergy between the spaces, um, but it also, it's very centrally located. This is a new school building and the classroom neighborhoods are around the perimeter. So these are very easy to access. Display and exhibition. Um, your teachers talked about this yesterday, the importance of multiple venues to celebrate student work. Uh, that can be in 2D, 3D format and cases. Uh, glass and closed, closed cases or venues for more professional kind of um, curating of student work or LCD uh, screen panels. So you certainly at the entry of the school want to give people a good first impression, but at different areas throughout the school provide venues for, um, for that celebration of student work. And outdoor learning, uh, we know that this is real important. Uh, we're thinking these days about outdoor classrooms 
So in this Bancroft Elementary School in Andover, you can see that um, there's a, a protected area with internet access and a blackboard, and now they have furniture there. Um, and this becomes an outdoor classroom that's easily accessible. Um, areas certainly for display for discovery and play and interacting with nature um, and uh, maximizing your site. And here at the Cabot Elementary School, um, which is a renovation addition, uh, you can see some beautiful uh, site work um, uh, that, that really kind of connects to also the fields of the school. And finally, uh, building as teacher. We've talked about sustainability as something very important to the district. Um, at the MLK School in Cambridge uh, on Putnam Ave, where they have geothermal wells and photovoltaic panels, all of the energy consumed by the building is, you can look at it minute by minute, students and teachers can interact with it in this touchscreen panel when you first enter, and then throughout the school there are different panels, um, as there are lots of information about how the building works and the recycling program. Um, some schools look at color coding uh, some of the systems and making it really clear or even putting a, a window into the mechanical room and labeling the equipment uh, so, that, so that the building itself really um, can be interacted with. So that's, those are 12, I, well, 18, the first six were givens. Um, so those are 12 uh, design pattern priorities that have been established as part of this process. And so we just like to, we're gonna be getting into small groups for you to ask more questions about this and also to, um, uh, to talk to you about what your priorities are. Uh, but first we'll just open up for Mentimeter once again uh, using menti.com and this code 5573500. And you can uh, tell us which of these things you're particularly excited about um, not that not at the expense of the others, but just the ones that um, that really resonate with you. While people are uh, finishing this up, I want to point out that in the chat, I have just um, uploaded a design pattern handout. And that has a, uh, it's a PDF document that has all of the design patterns that I just shared with you. And so um, uh, I would ask that you just double click on that and open it up. Because before you get it, once you get into your small groups, uh, meeting with your uh, person, your, your architect, um, you're not going to be able to access this. So it's, it's important for you to do it now um, so that you can visually access the design patterns. Because what we'll be doing in our small groups is we'll be really talking about um, the things that are, are most exciting for you. And you'll be collectively making a list of your top six to 10 design patterns. Uh, that you envision for this uh, renovated or new school. So um, please, uh, please do that. And then I will also say that, um, so we have Mike Morris with us. Hi, Mike. Um, and, um, and we have Donna with us from the design team who's going to be staying back in the larger group um, for anybody that would like to uh, not go into a small group discussion about design patterns, but would, but has other um, conversation that they want to have with the district about um, concerns or, or um, uh, priorities that you may have. So um, 
what we'll be doing is um, in just a moment, you're gonna be getting an invitation into a small group. And within that group, we're gonna spend, uh, it's 8.04 now. So we're gonna spend probably about uh, 25 minutes and, um, and discuss uh, what you're most excited about and what questions you have um, about any of the design uh, ideas that have been brought up so far. So any questions about that before we jump in? All right, so what we've done is we've made up um, a number of groups and, but what will happen is uh, we don't know how many people are not gonna go into the small group just yet. Um, so it may be that we re redistribute things once people, what, what you will do is you will get an invitation into a small group. Um, and um, and uh, so please accept that unless you wanna stay in the larger group, okay? Um, so um, with that, I'm going to um, say, have fun in your groups. Yeah, and hold on, David, sorry. Yeah. Um, this is Donna. I, I Donna. think, and I could be wrong, that if people joined late, they might not be able to have access to the chat. So if, if you can't see the chat and, um, or could only mm -hmm. see the, the late part of the chat, couldn't see everything else, I, Oh, I think Mike just went ahead and, and put it up. There's yeah. a Google Drive. Thank you, Yeah, Mike. I just made it, a, David, I just took yours and make it a, a Google link. Some people okay. I know uh, sometimes Excellent. struggle to download PDFs and, and just, it's the same thing. There's no difference. Yep. Okay. Um, is there anyone that's having a problem accessing um, the, the PDF? Okay. All right. Um, are we ready to jump into groups for 25 minutes? And um, okay, so we're gonna do that. And again, we may just, thanks, Carrie. Um, we may just uh, redistribute groups a little bit once we find out, you know, we wanna have a good, you know, four or five people in each group so we can have a good conversation. Um, all right, but just looking at the, our design priority slide before we, uh, uh, just how that how that all shook out. It looks like outdoor learning way up at the top, um, classroom neighborhoods and and breakout and pullover spaces, and those are very connected. Um, and um, collaborative environments, um, all all connected. STEM and STEAM way up there as well. Okay, um, so we'll see you in your small groups, and then we'll see you back here in twenty five minutes. Jump into the mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi. I don't know how many people will be joining. Um, so why don't we wait for a second? Sure. Let's see. I am. Okay, I'm room one and there are one, two, three, four, five, but I only see, okay, so there are a couple that are not joining. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for making the time to uh, join us. I'm Vivian Lowe with Denisco Design and would you mind if we just kind of took a couple minutes to introduce ourselves? Why don't we start with you, Anastasia? Hi, everyone. My name is Anastasia Ordonez, and I'm uh, a parent of a Fort River fifth grader and a uh, Amherst Regional Middle School seventh grader. And I live here in Amherst. Awesome. Thank you. Amber? I'm just going through my boxes. Hi, I'm Amber Connell Martin, and I'm a parent of a kindergartner at Fort River. And I'm also the parent of a fifth grader at Wildwood. And my kindergartner doesn't want to go to bed. He's right here. <laughs> <laughs> I know your type. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Aaron? Uh, I'm, I'm Aaron Hayden. I um, was a parent many years ago. So I raised my hand at the uh, member of the, of the community in the very first question there. Um, 
been involved in all kinds of stuff like this. I, I'm a, an engineer for a school in town. So <clears throat> this, is, this is all good for me. It's awesome to have you. I was wondering how many folks just from the community would join us. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. And Amaris? Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Amaris Cuevas. I'm a Spanish teacher for dual language, kindergarten caminantes. Um, awesome. I'm here for hearing everything that the people say. I'm so glad you're able to join us because you know, before the pandemic, when we used to do these, we would have uh, in-person visioning sessions and, and we would have teachers as well as parents and administrators. And it was just really great. We Sometimes we even had kids because if we had a series of these, we would invite the students as well. So they get to be really fun and um, very creative. So. In any case, we have an assignment. Um, do you have, have you had a chance to take a look or were you thinking about what some of your priorities may be as um, David was showing the slides? I could also put them back up. Uh, would you like me to put the slides back up so we could, okay. Let me share my screen. Let's see if I could do this. Um, Yeah, we're all getting so good at, at uh, Zoom nowadays, right? Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> I am challenged every day because there's always something that happens that doesn't work. But hopefully you can see my screen. Can you see the slides? Or actually, they're like they're images from David's presentation. OK. Y yes. OK. So I'd love for this to be a dialogue. We could. Um, you know, I, I'd love for you to just maybe one by one say what your priorities are, or we can go through the slides and say, yeah, that's something I'm really <laughs> interested in. I'm, we could do it any which way, but we don't have a whole lot of time. So uh, I'll, it'll be well, a free for all. No, I'm gonna jump in then just to try to cut to the chase. And maybe I'm hoping my, <laughs> my, my colleagues here will too. Yep. Um, I just wanted to, to chat or, or, or to chat with you about, um, the value and the importance of, um, it's, it's interesting how they change the names over time, but they're, they're called STEM now and STEAM. Yeah. You know, we used yeah. to call it art and culinary arts and music. And um, the, um, the thing that I wanted to say about that is that um, those spaces, those programs are valuable for learners along the whole spectrum. So the people that, need a lot of help in order to, to, to master the material and, and the things that, that students are in school for. Um, th those are the places where they can really be helped. There's a lot of tools there that, that uh, educators seem to have to reach and help them. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the, 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 the students that just, you know, you turn them on and off they go. Um, yep. They also, those are the same spaces interestingly, in, in my experience from when I was a parent, that support them as well. And sort of in the intervening years, since I haven't been an active parent, uh, I've been watching those spaces get squashed. Music is gone, um, arts are gone, and that hurts, even though it's supposed to help, you know, it hurts both ends of the spectrum. Um, well, it hurts everybody. When, when there are budget cuts, it seems to always affect those programs. So, right, and I think that's just a misunderstanding as to where the uh, the bang for the buck, the education buck, is. And also, you know, as a taxpayer, I'm just cheap. <laughs> well, you know, taxes just keep going up, so we we totally get it. Um, all right, so what I'm hearing is that what's really important that you see is a STEM theme makerspace program. Yes, and, and, and makerspace adjacent programs. There, there are things that are not makerspaces. You know, music is not a makerspace. The right. culinary arts is not a makerspace typically. And, and then, now makerspace is also being redefined. It's just right. a new, new term, so. Yeah, agreed. Okay, great. So that's your one, if, if there is one thing that you would like to see in a new or renovated school, this is what we really want 
to have. I'd like the pretty hallways and the secure front doors and the, and the, and the classroom clusters to be supported by STEM space. Yes, exactly. Great, thank you. Anastasia? Yeah, I, um, I definitely uh, echo what Aaron is saying. I also wanted to, for me, you know, I, just reading uh, recently um, this new research report that came out explaining that New England is actually the fastest warming uh, area of the United States. Um, and Massachusetts in particular will be experiencing climate change much faster than many of our other neighbors to the north um, and south. So I think that you know sustainable uh, building is extremely important for the future um, for many different reasons. Both practically speaking, I think we're going to have to just you know face the fact that um, heating and cooling will become a lot more difficult and challenging in upcoming years, and so we have to make sure that all of our buildings that are being built um, are sustainable and um, are you know if not uh, net zero, definitely have that aim. Um, I also think that um, just, you know, making sure that we have uh, spaces that are, you know, um, collaborative environments where students are prepared to learn in the modern environment and that they are able to feel like um, they can, you know, work independently or they can work in groups. All of that is also extremely important, I think, for the modern uh, school and for modern workspaces. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, I'm working now remotely, and most of the work that I've been doing in recent years has often been working at home behind a computer. Um, but also, when I get into a space with other people, I have to be able to work in a project environment, and I have to be able to work with others in, in those kinds of environments. So that's extremely important. Um, and, you know, extremely important for, for me, I think. And then the last thing I was going to say is that I actually think that our building as teachers is also helping us meet those sustainability goals. And having a building, it doesn't necessarily cost us that much more, or if anything at all, it's just thinking about it a little differently than we thought about buildings before, where we would hide the furnace in, the, in a room behind a closed door. Now we're actually providing, you know, a glass or transparent space so that students can learn from that and see what's involved in the operations of our buildings. And if we want people to be aware of, you know, the, their energy consumption in buildings, that they want them to be good 21st century citizens, they actually have to be able to see those things. The University, uh, UMass here, <laughs> UMass Amherst, sorry, I have a dog. <laughs> UMass Amherst has, a uh, has, yeah, a big dog, has built uh, a couple of buildings in recent years where they've actually implemented some of those technologies so that, you know, uh, visitors and students and staff that work there can see the day-to-day -day changes in consumption that's happening in those buildings. And, you know, again, it's just a panel on the wall. It's not anything more expensive or uh, much different, but it really does provide, I think, a different environment and shows students, you know, as especially very young ones, as they're learning about all the way that, you know, that we work and schools work and all of that, how that connects back to our values as a community. So those are the things that really matter to me. I feel like, you know, a lot of the other stuff we'll kind of figure out and, you know, and, um, and it's great to hear that the MSBA has these, uh, you know, many of these sustainability goals already in place. But yeah. I think that for the design patterns for me as an individual and as a parent, those are the things that I really want to see. Great. Those are so thoughtful. And you're, you're right. I mean, it scares me to see how the climate is changing. And, you know, as, as, um, as folks are putting solar panels on their houses, it's kind of a given now when we do new schools, we, we design them so that they can accommodate solar panels and be sustainable in so many different ways. But um, this is one of the priorities that um, the district has outlined. So we're definitely going to spend a good amount of time looking at that and making sure the school does, um, does, is sustainable as we continue down our path and hopefully it will change that path a little bit, right? With climate, with the climate change. So, of course in Amherst, Amherst, we require that of our capital projects just by absolutely. the way. Oh, and one other thing, please, none of those ceiling mounted fan coil units that you've been showing all the pictures for, no, just, just no. <laughs> Wait, we've shown, ceiling mounted fan coil units and, and, and almost every picture that that has been shown tonight any the air conditioning system has always been a vrf ceiling mounted unit and it's just like 
I, I'm sorry. I, that's what I do for a living, and it drives me crazy. Can we get oh. can we get that stuff down at, at a level where the guy doesn't need a ladder to surface it? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm oh, getting... oh, I see. You mean make things accessible so that I, I, I can like actually the be maintained. That yeah. Anastasia is talking about that this is this is great. Uh, you yeah. know, it's near and dear to my heart as a STEM guy, but yeah. don't hang it in the ceiling, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. All right, um, Amber. What about you? Um, yeah, I, I really like what um, Anastasia was saying about the importance of building as teacher and, um, you know, having it be a net zero sustainable building and I, I really share the concern about climate change um, myself so I, I echo all of that. Um, I mean in terms of what I, I saw that I would prioritize I mean everything looks amazing like I grew up in a school that looked like a prison right so it's like anything. Yeah. Everything you've shown is just like, oh my God, this is beautiful. This is amazing. <laughs> I want all of that. Yeah. Um, for sure. But I, I think like, you know, what I what I, I do really value about the schools now um, that my kids are in that I'd like to see continue is just the sense that it's like it's one, you know, school community, like it is a small school, like everyone's like sort of looking out for each other and cares about each other. Um, I like the stuff that's on the walls. That's like the student artwork. And I like how you come in and it's like how to say hello in every language. And there's like pictures of the kids and what countries of origin their parents are from. Like, it's just, you know, the whole environment just says like, this is us and it's about us as a community and as a school. And so as we get these like beautiful designs, like I still wanna maintain that in some way so that it still feels like, you know, the building itself is an expression of us as a community and, and our values. Um, so that being said, I mean, I, I really also um, prioritized outdoor spaces. Like I think, um, you know, outdoor space is super important. I have my kindergartner who just like wants to be outside and running around and playing all the time. And he's like a ball of energy. So like <laughs> the outdoor space is super important. And then like from, you know, my older kid, um, music is super important. And so like he's, you know, takes lessons outside of school, in school. Um, and it's it's just done so much to to improve his life and, and really, you know, make it better. So um, I want to make sure there's like really, you know, beautiful music space and a beautiful art space. Um, all those things that aren't necessarily academic, but they really like add to our kids' education and, and build them as people. Um, so that's really important to me as well. Great. Yeah. Now, I think, um, so as we talk about STEM and STEAM, STEAM is... So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, right? So when you throw in art or arts, that is what makes the STEAM, but you can define art in so many ways, right? There's fine arts, which is, um, you know, art the way we, we know it, painting and graphic design, et cetera. And then there are the performing arts. So some schools really integrate that piece of, um, of the STEAM into the whole curriculum where we, where we provide and design flexible spaces for performance, for um, just, uh, you know, learning stairs where kids could, um, and teachers can bring smaller groups out for informal meetings and informal presentations. So there's so many ways we can skin this cat. And the really great thing is that the MSBA now has folded into the program a, a STEM um, a STEM space. So now they support that, which in the, in the past they had not. So it's really, um, it's great because I think they're realizing the importance of that and how every child learns so differently. So that's all really, um, it's something that we will definitely address. Um, Amaris, do you have anything to, I'm sure as an educator, you must have so much you would love to see. So, so as we as you go through this, and thank you, Amber, because one of the questions I was going to ask if we didn't get to it is, what is it about your schools now that you actually love and you would like to see um, at a new or a renovated school? But go ahead. The teachers. Everything that's amazing is well, like of course a dream, dream a school. You know, yeah. that's like, hey, everything is super cute, like super amazing. The out, outdoor um, space for, for Leonard is amazing. If, mm -hmm. Especially in my case, so I'm a Spanish teacher, the kids learn Spanish. And oh. we need to do everything, like the hands-on and 
a more experience for they make um, connection for the language. Mm. Um, also, in flexi classroom is super important for us because we need to figure out the classroom in math in one way, in, in phonics in other way, in yeah. context in another. So change the classroom and bring the space for that, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So what is it about, it? are you at Fort River or Wildwood or are you uh, at Fort River? Fort River? So what is, what is it about Fort River that you do like, that you would like to see or improved at a new or renovated school? Mm, so I like the school, it's big, my classroom is big. The other classroom is more bigger now about for pandemic, but, I like my classroom is big, the storage. So in kindergarten, each teacher has the storage because mm -hmm. we have a lot of stuff for working with the kids. So yes. in the center, um, that's super like it. Um, what I improve, I improve the highway. We have like quacks. And sometimes when I'm walking with one kid, like we have running, Oh, yeah. you were an I. I don't know you. I mean, I see little D, and that's oh, no. it. So, um, sometimes I like I lost. So I'm gonna improve that. So how yeah. management the the highway for location location for the people when one walk or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The the school is um really interesting. But what I did find that I really liked was the large library space, the media center. And I don't know if, if that's something that most parents and teachers like or they don't, but it certainly, it, it was to me very large and flexible. It seemed like there were a lot of uh, different ways you could use that space. And the community uses it too, not only for school functions, but it's a way of connecting to the school. And it seems to be the center of it's like the hub of what's going on in the academic area at least. So, um, all right, so I'm going to, I didn't get a warning yet, but I'm going to share my other screen. Let me see if I can I'm, do that. I'm here, Vivian. David's happy Hello. face is there. Is that oh, the warning? Oh, hi. Hi there, hi there. Uh, we're doing fine. We've got, uh, we've got another uh, uh, probably eight minutes or so. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the photos that I was really bad at scrolling through and I'm gonna share my work. Yeah, one, one quick thing while you're, you're finding that, yeah. Vivian. Um, the one thing that I, that I like a lot about uh, Fort River is the outdoor garden space that ah. uh, teachers and students had started a few years ago. And it's small and it's not, you know, <laughs> It's not high tech in any way, right? But it's so happy and you have kids able to go in and, and grow some vegetables and you know learn how to tend for vegetables and things like that. I would love to have something like that continue um, you know, in, in a new school space. It'd be awesome if we had like a dedicated outdoor garden learning area where students mm. could go and you know, perhaps uh, learn little details about the plants that they're taking care of, learn how to, you know, the, the best kinds of materials like mulch and things like that to, you know, it's just, there's so many different opportunities in that kind of environment. So and, not and just an outdoor learning, but just an, an actual hands-on type space. Hands-on garden yeah. space, yeah, for sure. And I might that, expand on that and add. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would add that this, the, uh, I heard in the presentation about the technical free spaces where those human skills that are masked by technology or not exercised through technology, socializing, decision-making, all of those things, which the hands-on stuff that Dennis was just talking about does also foster. How do, you, how do you collaborate? How do you engage somebody to help you understand it? So, yeah. And th this is something we see a lot of schools. I mean, there's absolutely no problem building in gardens into the into the landscaping design. And a lot of schools are really valuing that. Um, we can also think about um, easy connections to the outdoors. A lot of times when you have a STEM or a STEAM space, you may have a garage door that opens directly out into an outdoor area. 
that allows you to build bigger things and um, and just expand outward if you need to. Yeah, it's like the Connecticut Science Center has that entire rooftop garden, which is absolutely oh, wow. amazing, right? My kids love to spend time out there and even in the winter because even when it's completely frozen over, they can walk among the beds and there's you know some sculptures and stuff that are in there. Mm. It's just really cool. And I'm gonna go check in on another group of five more minutes. Is Five more minutes, okay. Yeah. So I'm Hi. going to share, thanks Steve, David. I'm gonna share my um, tally sheet so that we can kind of fill that out. So if I could do that. Um, can you see I'm scrolling down. So top six to 10 design patterns. So I took some notes, which I'm going to edit and um, Ooh, yeah. clean up. But what I'm gonna do is plug in what I heard, which is, I was gonna do a tally, but I couldn't do that fast enough. So I'm gonna just plug these in and feel free to say, nope, nope, or let's add some because let's hear what the most important ones are. So sustainability actually was a, a very, very important one. So I'm gonna put. Yeah, and STEM was down in the middle. So. And STEM was that, okay, so where to rate these, right? I'm gonna say maybe two stars there. And let's see, um, outdoor, where is it? Outdoor class, outdoor learning, let's call that. What is one of them? So what would you say that is? A two star, three star, one star, no star? <laughs> so, so, I mean, the problem I have with this is that they're all, you know, absolutely, you know, they're, they're, they're all one star they're, or five stars, okay. whichever. Yeah, whichever so I'm gonna is. just, I'm gonna plug no. them all in. So they, they will be our top eight. Right, we can have <laughs> out of eighteen. I think we can do that. I don't know one. Yeah. Art, music, uh, flexible. I heard flexible. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From, from uh, a professional moment, so, so. Absolutely. Uh, storage was one of them. And let's see, building as a teacher. Right. And then I'm going to throw in all the other um, comments that you guys had, because I think they're also valuable. We aren't really, we are just at the beginning of collecting information. Um, we are going to do some test fits on the site to see what makes the most amount of sense so that we can compare all of the different options, right? Does an um, addition renovation um, make sense at Wildwood, addition, renovation at Fort River, a new building at one site or the other. So we're gonna look at all the different options and um, be able to kind of assign value based on the priorities and the criteria for um, evaluation. So all of these are gonna fold into then as we start to design the preferred option. And this again, is just the start of it because as we get into the design, design really starts after the next six months, really, really in earnest. And you'll have more opportunity then to participate. And certainly, um, you know, there's gonna be even more opportunity down the line once we get closer to completion of design too, where, um, where the principals may choose to create smaller groups for evaluating evaluation of the play, the play spaces, the outdoor spaces, um, furniture, technology, all of that fun stuff. So it's, again, we're right at the start and we just love hearing all of your feedback because it's so important. Um, this is gonna be your building, all, you know, the community's building, the, the educators, the parents, and, um, you know, we're the most proud when we open the doors and we hear the kids come in and say, wow, and the, you know, the parents, it's, and, and I've had that experience once, which is really sad because I'm never really there when they open, but we had that experience. And just to see the smile on the kids' faces were just, it was just um, 
so valuable. Anyway, so um, we are gonna close the breakout in less than a minute. Are there any last minute other items y'all want to share? Breakout space. Breakout space, yes. There, and that takes care of our eight. Number eight. Yes, breakout. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed talking with y'all. Thank you. Vivian. And there's going to be a third. Um, there's going to be a third visioning meeting in a few weeks. So maybe we'll see you all again at that point. It's easy to get here. <laughs> yes, isn't it great? <laughs> no, I hate Although it. I would <laughs> love to see people in person. So maybe yeah. after, maybe after the summer, we'll see. We'll nope. cross our fingers. All it right. was great to meet all you all. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tony. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. It was actually exciting. I got really good engagement and a lot of people with uh, very informed opinions. Uh, it's, uh, I, uh, I serve on the building committee in my town. We're doing an elementary school, too. And uh, this is refreshing com compared to what I do with at home. Yeah. Good. Hi. I'm Tim. There. How are you doing? Hello. So uh, this is your opportunity. If you have uh, strong opinions about anything that you've seen tonight or the project in general to uh, let them be known. Um, I mean, obviously I can't promise, promise that everything you say is going to be included in the project, but you know, this is our process for listening to as many people as we can, increasing the bandwidth, just having a discussion with everyone so that, you know, the ideas come through in more than a sentence. So if there's some nuance, some explanation, if that's available, uh, and then we can relay that to the rest of the design team. Uh, and then obviously, if you get bored with this conversation, you can go back to the main conversation where Mike and Don will be talking about big picture issues. But we can also talk about big picture issues here, um, and they will be um, considered by the entire team. Um, I don't really have a jumping off point other than what um, David has been talking about. But if any of you have a particular sure. interest aspect, uh, something that you want to see in the project or don't want to see in the project, have at it. I look at this list and just kind of wonder, you know, like I'm just, a, I'm not an educator. Um, there are things that I like on this list and, you know, those are interesting to me. I don't know that they should guide. You know, I wonder what the, like at what point does the administration or the educators, and I'm, obviously they've already, I mean, you've been having these conversations, but how does their input shape this versus ours? I mean, I, you know, like a cafetorium sounds great, but <laughs> you asked me tomorrow, it might be number 10 on my list. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? No, understood. And honestly, it's a, a how can I say, a complicated process because obviously the administrators sure. in, the, in the town has a fair amount of say and, and but yeah. this is a school for the entire community and we're trying to listen to everybody and accommodate everything. But, you know, specifically you mentioned the cafetorium, almost all elementary schools that are built in partnership with the MSBA these days have a cafetorium because they understand um, the importance of arts in the education. It's funded by the MSBA as part of their core curriculum, um, but they don't fund auditorium as David said. So. Um, a lot of the things that were mentioned in this list are going to be part of the project. It's just the way things are done. Um, but we are looking to see what is particularly important to Amherst so that it can come to the fore in the project. Um, and maybe time, energy, resources are spent more in that space or that relationship. Um, I will say that in almost every meeting, repeatedly, we hear about the importance of outdoor learning space. Um, and, that, and we haven't designed anything yet. But when we do, uh, I'm absolutely certain that it's going to come clear that we heard you loud and clear because, well, one, you have two sites, which is lucky. Uh, but both of them are really well suited. And um, large. I mean, I'll give you a background. A lot of the schools I've done are in urban neighborhoods, so this is, this is different, but um, 
but there is opportunity to bring those things into the program. So we're listening to you say things like that, that we can, you know, then make real in the final project. Yeah, thanks. Jim, I'm just wondering about some of the um, classroom neighborhood areas, the breakout spaces, extended learning spaces. It, how do you bring daylight into them? Um, if you know, if the classrooms are on the outside of the building, mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking at some of these spaces, and a lot of them in the pictures seem to be um, like artificial light. Mm -hmm. So, is there a way to bring, like, if they're on the ground floor and it's a two-story building, for example? How do you bring natural light into those inner spaces for shared group work? Sure, uh, and that is uh, a lot of thought will be given that during design. So as you mentioned, a two-story building, sometimes um, we are capable of uh, skylights and bringing natural light through openings in the floor to the first floor in common spaces, um, but we have lots of other means. Um, it comes down to glass at the side lights of doors between the classrooms and the common areas, or simply orienting the breakout spaces, the project learning areas in between the classrooms at the exterior wall. I mean, all of these things have considerations that need to be weighed against other priorities. If you take the pullout learning spaces, the small group instruction spaces, and put them at the exterior wall, obviously you're going to make the building a little bit larger. So there's efficiency implications, there's cost implications. Uh, but I mentioned outdoor learning, uh, just as much as that, we've heard daylighting from people in Amherst uh, to an extent, honestly, that um, it's always important. It has quantifiable effects on everything and, and no one disputes that, but we've heard it as a, a real priority from Amherst. Um, and so we will strive to include it. And then it, it affects everything. Uh, and you mentioned the two-story building. Uh, if it's a single-story building as well, what in Fort River are now, it tends to pancake a bit. Um, so the very middle of those buildings, if there's not light from above, which there isn't really now, uh, you're not going to get natural light. So um, if we reuse the buildings, there's probably going to have to be a lot of structural interventions to get light in, maybe remove parts so it's not as deep. Um, there are a lot of tools that we have to get light into the building, but we have to weigh them against all the other priorities that include efficiency, adjacencies of spaces, um, you know, time on learning as it's affected by kids moving from one end of the building to the other. And, you know, simple things as costs, which we don't like to admit are real, but they are, so. Any, uh, anything else? I mean, I, I can answer, obviously I can't answer questions about what the building's gonna look like, but I can answer questions about the process, about what the MSBA fund, what they won't, won't uh, what they won't participate in. Uh, I can't tell you how much they will pay at the moment because that's a, a convoluted uh, formula that no one knows at the moment. Um, it's, it's basically your chance to, if you have a strong opinion, let me know. I'll, I'll go again if Ellen, Ellen, do you have anything you want to say before I say anything else? Thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the outdoor spaces are pretty key for me and making sure the building is as energy efficient as possible. Um, and, you know, keeping the context of climate change in our minds. Um, and then as a parent of a special ed student, um, making sure that the spaces are as, I mean, I love that diagram of the school in Newton and, and what they had there, the, um, you know, the special ed classroom and the pull-out area and the kind of center community area, yeah. that, that was fantastic. I mean, one thing we struggle with quite a bit is how to integrate kids that are in sub-separate programs with gen ed kids and getting that time together and just, you know, talking about neurodiversity from preschool all the way up. Um, rather than the high school, which is kind of where the conversation is right now. And a design like that just made me feel like, you know, they would see each other and maybe be able to be together um, more often. So that's, I guess those are my two 
main perspectives after hearing and seeing the presentation. Uh, Amherst's uh, net zero energy bylaw is actually very forward thinking and um, we fully embrace it. It actually gives us some opportunity to do things that in other communities we can't uh, for practical reasons. And this is uh, a mandate to do it, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and then the efficiency in both the systems and the building are all tied together. So that's a, a great prospect. Um, and then you mentioned the service school. Uh, uh, we'll spend a lot of time trying, uh, trying to, um, you know, make sure that the spaces are appropriately clustered, that um, there's separation when needed, separation when it's not, you know, making sure that they flow together. Um, getting all of those spaces to work together is where we're going to spend a lot of time in systematic design early in the process. And it's good to hear that input. And just picking up on Ellen's comments about the climate change, do you know, Tim, what kind of cost it adds or complexity it adds to incorporate climate resiliency hub um, for the community into school? Like I imagine there's in the case of a climate emergency, for example, if they the members of the community needed to use the gym or the cafetorium for you know, air conditioning during a heat wave or warmth during a snowstorm when there's when there's energy blackouts, mm -hmm. they need like more power outlets to power their phones and things like that. Like what have you done it in any schools before? And if you have or if you've heard of it, do you know how much it adds to the project in kind of complexity and in cost? Um, in complexity? Not that much, honestly, because there is going to be a um, backup generator that will power a certain number of systems. Uh, at the base level, it will keep emergency lighting on. It will prevent the building from freezing in the winter, and it will keep the food from going bad in the course. Um, if you want to do more than that, if you want to have a resiliency hub, if you want to have a shelter, um, in terms of complexity, it's not much more, but the cost you up because the size of the generator goes up here. Um, if you're at the Fort River site, it's going to be a gas power generator service may go up. But um, yes, there's a cost. What it is in terms of percentage of the overall cost, I really can't tell you right now without knowing a whole lot of other things. But um, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's I don't want to say, yeah, adjectives on numbers are, are can get you into trouble but uh, it is a, it is a quantifiable cost that many many towns decline to um, exercise simply because there is a cost unless if they, if they don't have some other means of design of providing a, yeah, a resiliency of a shelter or something like that I hope that answers your question in a roundabout sort of way yeah thanks I, I was just Curious because I imagine it wouldn't if if the community prioritized that if it was important to the the community at large I imagine you would need to know that soon so that you can build it into the early design. Absolutely. So big decisions like that in terms of how large the systems are, um, the systems that are going to allow us to achieve net zero uh, uh, geothermal well field if it's part of the project, uh, photovoltaics if they're part of the project. Those will all have to be not detailed, but essentially coordinated and sized by the time we issue schematic design to the MSBA, which is the basis for the project funding agreement. Um, so that will be submitted at the end of the year, essentially. Um, so we're gonna do PDP where we get the educational stuff down. And we're gonna do PSR where we pick an option, that'll be June. And then SD will be at the end of the year. And so when we have SD um, that all, that the agreement with the for funding is based on will have the mechanical system size will have the, the outline of all of it so all of the things that you're talking about now the big picture items will be uh, locked into place and yeah there will have to be uh, a robust uh, conversation about what is important uh, and you know this is the first step of it How many of these school projects have you personally worked on? 
personally worked on. So I've worked on a bunch from start to finish in this role. This is my third. Um, I did, I just completed one in Springfield, did one in Bluebird, um, and then worked on a bunch in various capacities. And then I had a whole other career in other architecture stuff before school. So. Mm -hmm. Is the MSBA still, is, do they have the capacity to throw any uh, last minute surprises in? Or do you kind of have it down? Um, the thing about the MSBA is last minute surprises are so thoroughly beaten out of the process by the bureaucracy that um, they have their quirks. They have things that don't necessarily make sense if you were to do it over again. But um, last minute surprises is not one of the things that they do. They, no. you know, you, you you know when you're going to do stuff with them a year ahead of time. Uh, a, a bigger complaint uh, about the MSBA, not to complain about someone who's going to give you quite a bit of money for your project, but, um, is that they take too long because they're state state agency. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's what they're good at. But uh, they're very thorough. Uh, they do a great job for a lot of communities, and they build wonderful schools. So, um, that is thanks. That is the constant. Should we go back to the main group, or should we? Is there sure. anything else you need from us, Tim? Or, or no, uh, maybe uh, I. If if you have anything else, um, absolutely. But uh, also. At any time, feel free to go back. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming tonight. Tim, I have one other question for you. Just, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ellen. Oh no, I was just saying thank you. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, is is this process normal? Having done several of these things, is this process of engaging with parents in this way, albeit under normal circumstances, you might do it in person, but is yes, this a normal part of the process or is this an amorous part of the process? It's a normal process. Um, I would say in some communities, it's a lot more engaged than others. I mean, we have, I have worked in communities where honestly no one shows up, um, where people are just happy to be getting a new school. I've been in communities where the biggest priority is they don't want their taxes to go up. So there is a full spectrum uh, just like there, there are 300 plus towns in Massachusetts municipalities, I should say, and there are yep. probably about 500 different uh, ways this meeting could go. So <laughs> <laughs> makes it fun, fun to plan. It for, does. Sure. Um, I, I, I will say that Amherst is very informed, educated, positive. Um, you can tell that people just want to good project um, uh, many, many times majority of the people that show up are against the project in some way and i don't get that sense of amherst at all we'll see <laughs> yeah, yeah well, we haven't met everyone yet so <laughs> um, um, yeah I, you know, even those voices are good because they they keep our feet to the fire they make us uh, you know they hold us to the highest possible standard. I mean, that's that's what you do when you're going to solve things. We accept that and we actually encourage it because it makes the project better. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. Yep, no problem. I'm going to leave the room and join the big room, but this has been good. Thanks. Yep. We'll stop. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is my sixth grader, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, you're going to be able to take notes here? I am. I'm ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Uh, you've also got, this is the same presentation that David just went through. And uh, and you also that you've gotten the PDF from, and what except it's four to a slide. But what I'd like to hear from 
you all is what resonated with you. Uh, what of the, of the design patterns did you really like and why? Everybody clicked on things to prioritize. But what we'd like to do is to uh, just uh, you know come up with like the things you really, really like, the most important, maybe a half dozen to, to uh, your, your favorites, just maybe in order. And that will help, uh, help guide the priorities as we move forward with design. So would anybody mm -hmm. like to start? You can also start by asking a question. We can... I... I can take a crack at it. Sure. Um, so the outdoor learning spaces I put at the top in part because we don't know how long COVID is going to be around or the next pandemic mm -hmm. or just in general, I think, you know, having the ability to be outside um, regardless of what kind of precipitation is, mm -hmm. is I think a really nice option. Um, the the second thing that struck me is um it sounds it's like a little bit fear based but the the you know i think um in the wake of sandy hook a lot of us were really um keenly aware of the the problems with fort river and wildwood in terms of safety um and you know i feel like the school has had to make accommodations so now you know you like push a little buzzer and there's a camera and you know it's like kind of the opposite of feeling welcoming so that idea of welcoming yet safe um i think is really important um for our student body um and then so sustainability is important to me and um i love the idea of the building as teacher um, I just think there are a ton of opportunities there for, you know, creating lifelong awareness of the built environment and how we interact with it and the impact it has on the environment. Yeah. So that just seems totally cool. Um, and then I guess I had a, a little bit of a question about that, which is, um, at one point I was talking with an architect friend about the fact that we have a net zero bylaw in Amherst. And she was like, whew, okay. Like, you're not gonna have a school with a lot of bells and whistles. Like, you're not gonna have beautiful wooden ceilings because just making the building net zero is gonna like eat up all the costs. So it's gonna be like a pretty basic rudimentary structure with like kind of the cheapest materials because getting to like the net zero is going to require a ton of, you know, capital. So I would love to hear a reaction to that from the architects in the house. That's, um, that's, I'm happy to say right off the top, that that's not necessarily the case. Certainly, certainly somebody might approach it like that, but it's, it's uh, possible to have, uh, to have exciting, inviting uh, buildings that you're enthusiastic about that happen to be net zero or even, uh, you know, net zero positive. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a number of projects on, on, on tap. We've had a couple of recent successes in that manner. So, you know, it's, you know, I had a professor in college that said everything's possible and that's the problem. Uh, it's it's establishing priorities. Net zero is a, a fact of life, but it doesn't shut the door to everything else that we're talking about. Sure, yeah. if your idea to have an outdoor learning is to have a 10 by 12 roll-up door in every classroom, that's going to make net zero pretty hard to, to achieve. That's yeah. also pretty hard to meet the basic energy code doing that too. So it's all it's all a balance, but it doesn't mean you have to give up one for another. And then I didn't say this, but because it seems like it's just implicit, but to me, the you know the daylighting and just like bringing daylight into as many corners of the building seems just so important. Yeah. 
I have a, is- my sister-in-law is a school nurse and, you know, she spends mm-hmm. her day in a dark cubby in the interior of one of these buildings. And it just, it's just soul crushing. There actually used to be a weed credit and I, it was the first time I saw a weed before, you know, what we talked about, we mentioned weed, but it, it was for having stairways that were bright and inviting and made people want to use them instead of using the elevator. And it, rec- it recognized, recognized that light is good, views are good. You can turn something that, you know, and certainly there are a lot of 60s examples that are a silo with steps in it, uh, but turn it into a learning environment with vistas and views. And that can be a way to get, there's a question about what was borrowed light, but introduce borrowed light into a corridor that may not have it by having elements like stairways be very bright and inviting and transparent. Mm-hmm. Well, that was a, that's a good start. Anybody else want to jump in? Nicole? Hi, can you can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Sweet, great. Hello, um, I'm Nicole. I'm the art teacher at Fort River. Um, and I see there's some families. And hi, Oscar, there's one of my sixth graders. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of the things that um, one of one of the realities that we're facing in Amherst right now, definitely at Fort River, but I know this is true in all the schools, is that um, with the way that the schedules are squeezed and teachers have been sort of like contorted into not having a lot of time and and the buildings are pretty sprawled out, one of the sort of struggle points, both in terms of like building logistics, but also in like um, student sort of like wayfinding, but also like mental transitions throughout the day is that there's a huge amount of distance between um, classrooms and the spaces that the entire school needs to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now at Fort River, the library is the most cent- most central place, which is awesome. But like the music and tech spaces and, yeah. and cafeterias are like these way remote, like far away things. And the transition time is really hard to build into our schedule. And transitions are the time when student behaviors are the most likely to explode. Um, Like statistically, if you look at um, behavior patterns in the schools, transitions are one of the biggest struggle points for a lot of students. And we have a lot of ways of coping with that, but if the building helped to um, minimize the stress of transition and the length of transition, that would be awesome. So I was really excited about the, I was excited about the classroom neighborhoods and the innovation hub, but my concern would be if those things are then located far from each other, then the class, the kids couldn't get to those other hubs. Like they could get to the other classrooms, but not to the, mm. like all the specials that they'd be then using every day. So I wonder, you know, if there's, if we think about the spaces that the entire school uses, right? Like a, mm-hmm. a single classroom is only used by a single grade level, right. but places like cafetorium, art room, music, PE, tech, library, um, special ed spaces, the guidance suite, all of that, right? If we can have all of those things nested centrally somewhere, um, but still like on the edges so that we have windows, because if the art room doesn't have windows, I'm going to go nuts and so is everybody else. (laughs) Um, But but so like, please, oh my goodness, have the art room on a wall, but also if they were centrally located and not like way at the edges, that would really help like behaviorally and logistically for all of our kids. Understood. One of the things, and you're in a one-story school right now, and having a multi-floor school would be a radical change for anybody that's teaching in a single-story school, but it, 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 it can be possible to get closer proximity to special, centrally mounted specials if you have, uh, you know, multiple levels. And so that's something that we look at. The other thing uh, that we look at is not only all those cores, but you know, the spaces are, are called core spaces, and the core spaces actually, because everyone wants to get them, doesn't really want to be in the core too. They want to be centrally located. But there are also components of those that also want to be available to the public. And uh, available in the public off hours without people tracing through other buildings uh, or the building. So that's a consideration. And this is all a very, a very uh, delicate dance about 
priorities and we'll also be talking eventually as we get into design about adjacencies. Uh, K-5 schools that have a strong theater uh, arts program might try to get the arts and music rooms at the back of the cafeteria very close so they become green rooms. And, and so that starts to, to gather uh, you know, the arts together and put them in a location that's, that's, uh, that's centrally located. Uh, so yeah, I hear you. It's uh, one thing that the classroom uh, concept of a cluster thought concept the neighborhood does it also stops the school from having a million mile long corridor and which, which can be oppressive. But you're right, it, it's a, it, you don't want to send somebody to the other end of the building because that's an opportunity for mayhem. Uh, and we'll be working together to, to develop the adjacencies and, and come up with plans that, that would work. Awesome. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, years ago when we went through this process before they had uh, like a pair of art rooms on the second floor kind of above um, a lot of other main spaces. And I, I totally loved that idea. The art rooms mm -hmm. had a balcony. Um, it was uh -huh. amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, whenever um, I, I would hereby like to volunteer that whenever you're ready to discuss adjacencies, I would like to be at the table whenever you're ready to have teacher input on that. <laughs> so noted. How about any, any, anything else? Anybody else think of anything? Uh, something, something new you want to add? Any questions for me? I don't really it. have anything new to add, but I just wanted to emphasize, um, you know, like Johanna, I also, and my name's Carrie, I'm a, a parent. This is a, hopefully a future <laughs> student at one of these schools and then I'm also a former school committee member so I've been thinking about this stuff a lot um mm -hmm. but I I just know that you know we really had to cut back you know like we had to take both Wildwood and Fort River are now not struggling with you know size you know space constraints and so I think mm -hmm. no matter what I, I'm sure this is included in the givens but just having enough space for um breakout rooms for special ed enough space for mm -hmm. all the specials that we need outdoor learning opportunities that benefit not only the students who are enrolled in our schools, but the you know, younger and maybe older kids too, who, who live in our community and who may not be enrolled in our public schools. Um, I think I'd really, you know, just love to see a healthy building. I know this is a given, but I just wanna emphasize it is, you know, a building that has natural light where um, staff and students have, you know, spaces that, that, that just feel really welcoming. Um, so, I'm excited about this process, and I think you know it's it's hard to really rank things because I it's, these are all exactly. so important. But I, I think especially in the time of COVID, you know, the outdoor learning and and the ventilation and mm -hmm. and just creating buildings that meet kind of these minimum standards will just be such a such a nice nice thing for our community. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So one thing that I heard. Uh, was one of the comments, and I, and I, uh, it was about outdoor spaces and outdoor use, and it was a comment about having uh, restrooms available to people using the outdoor spaces, uh, uh, off hours and things. And I know that that exists at Fort River, I think. And uh, is that something that? you think would be used or would be sustainable? It's, has it has been a, a problem in the past because I see that it exists. It's funny, I haven't heard of that comment. <laughs> and like I said, one of the comments that came up in, in the first Yeah, yeah, no, I saw it here. I, I hadn't okay. heard it in the past. And I think it's important, but I guess I just would worry about who's responsible for maintaining and carrying the cost right. of that type of um service because i think that would be great but mommy. i think it would be a lot to place on the elementary schools to cover the cost of maintaining throughout the entire year oh, mommy. Well, I, I, don't, because I know there business. are outdoor bathrooms at fort river and you know for like for example the ultimate frisbee teams mm -hmm. like the middle schoolers will come on the bus 
change in the bathrooms and then go and practice on the fields at Fort River. I don't know whether that falls to the Fort River custodial staff to manage that space or not. Um, Usually they don't change in the bathrooms. No, and I'm pretty sure they don't. Nope. Usually, you, usually the bathrooms are in horrible shape. Yeah, half of the time they're closed up. Okay, too. and half okay, the time so they're closed up. The reason why I'm taking this opportunity to ask is it's the first time I've ever seen a comment at what comment like that and I, and I knew that it existed at Fort River and I just wanted to get some spin if, if that was a voice for like oh yeah that's that's a big deal that's an amenity that that's worked out great but okay thanks thanks for just filling in a little bit on that uh Brian do you have any thoughts I'm just following along with everyone else. Okay. So let's see. So outdoor learning. Uh, get a page. How much, I guess, how much outdoor learning space uh, do you think would be, get used? I mean, it, it's become a, uh, a common practice to have a space or two now. Uh, David showed uh, a couple of locations were outside, even the, one of the warm inviting uh, photos of uh, Harold Wyman uh, at the beginning of the Gibbons that was actually an entrance way that uh, also could serve as an outdoor learning space. During COVID, were, were the kids outside a lot? And we Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, as much as possible, teachers have been trying to, um, to teach outside, you know, weather permitting and, and temperature permitting mostly. Mm -hmm. um, we did have some like small tents that were put outside that only worked to an extent, like you couldn't really fit a whole, there's one that was gigantic and then many that you couldn't really fit a whole class mm -hmm. under with social distancing anyway. Sure. Um, I think, uh, I think, and we do also have this great garden classroom out in the back fields yeah. that's totally beautiful and lovely. Um, and for instance, I would do a lot more like outdoor nature sketching if my room weren't on the complete opposite corner from it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's quite a ways away from most classrooms, including some of the ones who might otherwise use it the most. Yeah. And so I think with outdoor learning spaces, it's again, a matter of proximity. Like I think having multiple, if, you know, in my wildest dreams, I have no idea if, this, if the like surface area accounts for this, but there would be like several adjacent outdoor classrooms around the edge of the building so that whoever's nearby can use whichever one is closest to them and not have to like you know walk mm. all around the whole building to go get to it because i don't know like art class is only 40 minutes these days but who know, maybe that'll change in my wildest dreams i don't know right. um but, but like 15 minutes getting everybody there and settled in there yeah exactly yeah. and um and you know uh another thing that i've seen work really well at summer camps actually is like um is like covered porch style learning spaces where uh, it's not like a freestanding pavilion, but it's like, if you imagine just a really spectacularly gigantic covered porch pergola type object, mm -hmm. such that you could have a whole classroom's worth of floor area under a, a waterproof roof, and then you could be outside even when it's warm and rainy, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing would be right, right. next to the building because it would lean against the building, have a door to the inside, but then still be usable mm -hmm. no matter the weather. Um, and that kind of thing I've seen work really, really well. Good ideas, thank you. I'd also like to mention that, I mean, and hopefully we won't be in this place when this building's built, but outdoor eating has been really important. And I can't, I mean, for me personally, like when I take a break mm -hmm. at lunch to take a walk or just to get outdoors, it's always nice. And I imagine it's the same thing for students. And we, I know that there's been an emphasis on trying to get kids to, you know, take lunch outdoors for safety right now, but I can't imagine that we'd want to completely eliminate that in the future. So I don't know if there's a way to connect the cafeteria to outdoor mm -hmm. space as well. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. How does 
you know, right now um, I'm stuck just thinking like, oh, our elementary schools are one floor structures. Therefore, that is how elementary schools work. But like Nicole was just referencing that, you know, I don't remember the previous school design, but that it was two levels and how, I don't know, does MSBA have thoughts about that? Do you have thoughts about that? Does it depend on the site? It seems like a much more efficient use of total area to have it be two stories, but. A two-story building uh, or more, I don't want to freak you out, but we've done a number of three-story A5 buildings in the last few years. And very often, uh, and, and that can be a big departure for people that are coming out of a 1957 one-story building mm -hmm. to be confronted with a three-story building. Uh, certainly, site availability, you know, can make it not be a choice, but say, if you want to do all this stuff on your site, you've got to have a more compact building. It is, you can zone it. Um, we've put gymnasiums on second floor over cafeterias. Uh, the gymnasium being on the second floor of a two-story school. So that's, you know, one flight up, one flight down, or, or, or uh, you know, a horizontal jaunt to it. So there can be, uh, it, can, it can make the building easier to get from point A to point B. It can, granted, be larger on the site than what you're used to. It can be very different than what you're used to as far as being a one-story one -story building. And so change, when confronting with change, it's something that you gotta get brought along on. But, it's also a, a multiple story building is more compact and it's, in, it's environmentally friendlier. You've got less surface area. It's easy to make your, your energy loss calculations. You don't have as much roof and as much outside wall. You've, you've uh, improved in that way. So there are pluses and minuses. There, there are considerations for the neighborhood. Uh, but if you saw you know, the Cabot School in uh, the last slide. Hi, folks. David here, just checking in. We've got about five more minutes in our. Okay. Thanks, David. All right. Yeah, let's see. Oh, boy. What slide is that? I'm sorry. I'm fumbling here. I'm, I'm tampered with a laptop, so I don't have a big. So. I'm looking for a red. So, so here are a couple of uh, examples this is it. in here of two-story schools and uh, and then the Cabot, which being a renovated building is, is even taller. Well, that doesn't work when it's 1,200 times its size, does it? Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll lose the outdoor learning slide back up there. So, so the Cabot School here is an example of a, of a, of a small 20s neighborhood in Newton, which has some very tall spaces, a three-story addition, a three-story existing building, and a tight single-story, you know, two, three-story residential neighborhood with functions like the gym being readily available. And and this this was a very small site. So this this kind of forced the fact that it was an addition and a renovation. Uh, and uh, it was a very small site that, that actually also included closing the street to get this much area is a way that uh, you get all the function on the site, you get small travel distances, you can zone the building, and it's still, it's kind of a different type of feel than what you've got. Now, you're not starting with a three-story building, so any of your addition renovation schemes you know, it wouldn't be a three-story addition next to a single-story building, but it wouldn't it be unheard of if 
there wasn't a, a, an addition renovation scheme, but there might be a two-story addition to a one-story building or something like that. So it's all things to be considered. And we'll be flipping through all of those permutations as we go through. I will say one of my, I love the balconies and I love that, um, that what is it called? The teaching stair. Like mm -hmm. that struck me as like a really, just a cool space. Okay, um, I apologize for stumbling through that visual example. Uh, any thoughts about how you use the uh, space outside of classrooms and classroom cl clusters? I have no idea. I'm not an educator. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't hear the tail end of that question. I'm just wondering if, if there's any appeal. Uh, th this is a, a school that has a cluster of four graded classrooms. So uh, I think this for these are the uh, uh, third grade classrooms and the second grade classrooms are across the way. It's a cluster of four. A cluster of four. A hallway going to core space in the middle and then there's a stair and some breakout space in the end. But you know some of the decisions that we work with the educators on are where do the kids store their stuff? Are you a cubby school? Are you a locker school? Are you a cubby school for for kindergarten, maybe first grade? Or if anyone wants to stay and has other general comments, um, I guess I'll be sure, hanging out. Yeah, for those people <laughs> that want to stay, for those people that want to stay, Mike and Donna are going to be here to talk to you. And and if no one stays, Mike and Donna, uh, you can jump into. Just let us know. We'll put you in a group. Great. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm actually uh, have to leave to go do bedtime with oh. my guys in kindergartner. So, um, but this was a really terrific presentation. Thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. And we have a community forum coming up, which will talk a little bit more about the project itself, sustainability, and um, how we're going to evaluate and rank the options, et cetera. So um, I hope you continue to join Great. us. Yep. Um, and Sarah, if you have any questions for me, sorry, I was at a Pelham School Committee meeting, but I'm here now. I'm Mike, and you get enough emails from me where you know how to get in touch easily with uh, me by replying to any of my many. Uh, but, you know, if there's any questions you had that you would have wanted to jump in on, you know, please do get in touch with me. And I'm in frequent you. communication with the design team. I'm happy to, to share your, you know, your feedback, answer your question, make sure the design team Thank sees you. it as well. And I saw a lot of friends here on the, um, on the Zoom, so it's good to see a lot of people. So thank you. Thanks for doing this at night and for all your work. Good night. Good luck. Good night. Bye. So it looks like, um, David, there are a few. Yeah, I'm going to visit each group to make sure that they're OK. It looks like these folks are staying in the larger group. So we've got we've got about four people, four or five people in each group. OK, so I think there were a few people that, or one person that just joined. So um, I don't know who that was. Let's see. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to go visit um, visit the groups. If anybody is, is there anybody in this larger group that would like to go to a small group to talk about? Oh, Sarah, you had your hand up. Oh, no, That's go ahead, finish question. your- <laughs> Okay, all right, good, good. All right. Um, I think I'll probably jump into a small group. Um, okay. Would join you like it. I, it's, it's, I'm in four, group four, if that helps. Uh, actually, but, yeah, what, yeah, but there's no one there. So we're gonna help <laughs> you. We're going to put you in group um, in group three. You'll get an invite. Right. I will join in them. Should I do not now for group four? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Yeah. 
but I just wanted to hang with this group for just a minute because I, I I know there were some things discussed um, in a kind of very specific thing at the last meeting, and and I think this might be the more appropriate group to talk to about it. Um, so I don't know if it's if, if anybody else had anything or if I should just hop into what I wanted to say. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So so there's been a, a community member brought up. Um, this idea about the special education programs um, advocating that they be broken up um, and and put at both the the Crocker Farm Elementary School and and the new school building and I'm a parent of a of a kiddo um, that's been in that program for a long time and I was the special education parent advisory council president for a couple years and you know I think where this idea is coming from is from the last school project where one of the great advantages of a consolidated school was where because we have these consolidated special education programs it meant that kids no longer would have to be an out of district out of enrollment zone placement and there's quite a bit of disruption and stigma um, that is problematic for families who, who need access to those programs um, and so it was a great feature and that one of the biggest reasons I was really a big proponent for that last, you know, consolidated um, idea. Um, but now that's not on the table anymore. Um, and, and I think if you, I mean, I, I haven't heard any special education family who are a part of that program think that those programs can be as strong if they are broken up into multiple buildings. We just don't have the number of students needed to do that um, and provide the depth of para support that we get, the amount of expertise we get. And our students really are a unique population that we need strong expertise. And if we try to do that, I'm afraid what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have more students with out of district entirely placements that our programming will be so watered down that kids will not be feeding into the middle, you know, we're gonna end up with a much more expensive interventions needed that they're not gonna be nearly as included in our community. They're gonna be bused far away and our programmings will really suffer from that attempt to do something like that. And I'll have to say too that, you know, our where we're moving, one of the big things that is happening with this school plan is that we're going from two enrollment zone or currently three enrollment zones to two enrollment zones. So this will be less of an issue for, for many kids. We've you know cut the problem by two thirds to start with. We have instituted or, or shortly, hopefully going to institute, the school committee voted on it last year. I don't think it's been implemented yet. Um, a sibling enrollment policy so that siblings can attend the same school with with other with the special education students who need to be in these specialized programs um, and the other big thing is that we have a dual enrollment or the dual language program that now pulls students from the entire district so that means if i'm walking down the street with my kiddo in my neighborhood the first question isn't oh it, what grade is your kid in at fort river because that assumption is no longer there because of the dual and dual language enrollment thing you can be in a school that is not your quote neighborhood school anymore and it and it can be for something other than special education which takes away a ton of the stigma ton of the assumption ton of the just like assumption that you're going to go to the school on the corner because that's not true and now it becomes a much more equitable way to access our school system because of the existence of that dual language program and so i i'm one you know it just seems like a holdover from a way of thinking of a previous project that is not really relevant anymore to the way we're thinking about this and um and i'm really fearful that that idea takes traction when it's really an idea that is not being brought forward by people who are involved in the program in any way and, and I think it's really something our community, we always, you know, are, are really great proponents of, of um, social justice and equity. But I think sometimes people speak for others from a knowledge base that they don't have. And it's really important to let the voices of the people 
who have experience with these issues have the floor. And I really hope that that idea, the idea of needing to divide up these, these takes any traction because I don't, I really don't think it's a good one. I don't think it's coming from a place of knowledge or intensity or lived experience. And I, I hope that the folks, um, I just hope that idea doesn't go anywhere because I don't think it's a sound idea in this context. So I talked a long time, sorry. No, Anyone? Heather, it's okay. Can I <laughs> jump in, David? Is that okay? Um, so I'm gonna speak uh, because I agree with a lot of what you said, I'll, I'll try to be succinct. Um, and there may be other people with other questions. So this was talked about at the school committee uh, slightly pre-pandemic, which you know years all blend together. Um, but, uh, and folks came up with a lot of the same perspectives you did and particularly the staff because we we're looking at one program in particular and potentially splitting it unrelated to a building project. And I met with the staff and the staff said, look, we can't offer the same level of programming if we're in two different places. We just can't, right? We have two classrooms for a subset of students that in theory have similar needs, but in reality, the range of needs in those programs is, is much more significant than the lay person might believe. Yes, a program might be for students with um, complex and multiple disabilities and intellectual disabilities. The range of that group of students is huge and they're able to group students in ways that are really thoughtful. Uh, and also there are sometimes students who don't, shouldn't be in the same room, right? You know, so the idea of having two rooms in the same school is no one has to change schools. If that happens, the dynamic can be done. So, so we talked about that a while ago. Uh, the more practical nuts and bolts reason is there's just frankly not gonna be space at Crocker Farm to have uh, the program set up that way. So, but what we heard from staff is the level of collabor collaboration uh, expertise that different staff members would bring if the programs were split in that dynamic, which is to your point, Heather, very different than the prior project where all the second through six words be in one place. So that there's nothing comparable in this setting. Um, and so we heard that feedback loud and clear. And I think something I said at the last school committee meeting was, you know, when we have our educators very clearly stating, this is a model that that is working for our students. And if we split the program, we won't be able to do that. Remembering that elementary school is sixth grade levels, which is another point they raised that they're able to do a younger kid cohort and an older kid cohort and, and how valuable that is. So at this point, there's no plans to, I wasn't, I'm sorry, I was at a Pelham school committee meeting. I was not able to be at the first part of this meeting, but the same thing came up at the prior meeting as well, um, the prior community meeting. And uh, I'll do a little more detail because it came up at school committee as well, but there are no plans to relocate um, specialized programs uh, in general, um, you know, that the preschool we imagine will stay at Crocker Farm is nicely designed spaces for that program. Um, and for Building Blocks Ames um, and the ILC uh, to position them. And I think the other access point is that we want those students, sorry, I'm not gonna be succinct as I promise, sorry, Heather. Um, but the other point that, that we, I thought about since is we want all of the students to have access to our Comandantes programs who are in the specialized programs. And if we split them, we're adding a like a matrix of decision making of what school different kids go to, and it could eliminate access or reduce access to being part of a program that can be absolutely wonderful for students in specialized programs who also want to be connected or have cultural connections to uh, um, Spanish language and and cultural aspects of that. So at this point, that's not in the plans. I just want to be really clear. So um, you know, I think I, I heard that feedback a couple of times. Uh, we've talked about it multiple times over the last three years at school committee unrelated to a building project and nothing at this point is convincing us that splitting the programs in the best interest of children. Sorry, less succinct than I hoped, but but and it's a worthwhile point to not be succinct about, I think. So, um, but thank you for raising it. Mike, yeah, Derek? Mike, is there any way that I can offer um, something as a Crocker Farm principal? I, I don't know if Perry is still in the call or, or not. Um, Hello, Heather. How are you? Good to see you. Um, I, I, I'm glad that Heather, you know, raised this point. And, and the only thing I'd like to add is that the, the one thing, and I'll say this uh, over and over again, is that um, not, not the one thing that concerns me, but, but I will say this, is that if, if there are now two schools from three, what will happen is that this brand new school will have all of these various experts all in this one building, right? And then we won't have these experts at Crocker Farm. And so what I want to just make sure is that we continue to have access to these experts because there's a sort of continuum to how all of this plays out because we often will have students who are in, quote, their, their own home school, 
who perhaps there's an inkling that they may actually be, be needing something uh, additional for their services. And, and so I would just be asking that, that, that it doesn't become like the new school is the place where this sort of area of expertise where they can easily walk from like one part of the building to then go collaborate with someone else where Crocker Farm is like, you know, 15 minutes down the road and it takes a little bit more of a sort of complex scenario for us to get the, 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 the consultation or collaboration we need. And so I think, I think Heather raises a brilliant point. And but for me, it just is this whole idea again about sticking up for Crocker Farm to make sure that we don't become like the, the, the yeah. Oh, Derek, it's so a point well taken. And I look at this, that makes sense, Heather. You know what I mean? Like, no, yeah, I, I hear point. you. And, yeah. and this is a, something that is so tough when you're doing a project like this. I feel that, that it's an opportunity to change so much, you know, that, that there's, a, there's a desire to solve every, everything yeah. with <laughs> one project. And there's no such thing as solving everything because as soon as you solve it, it's, something else is going to pop up, right? So it's always a work in progress. So I hope, I really hope that as a community, we understand that this is just one step on a path and that we get this building built, we keep saying yes, we keep working on our programming, we keep doing all the things we need to do to evolve as a community, but knowing that we need some physical infrastructure to support that, and it has to be better than what we have now. And, and I really hope we don't get hung up on, on solving every problem in, in a way that keeps us from, from solving a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the last thing I'll say and then open it up because I think Derek's point's a good one and, and thanks Heather for that is that uh, something that I continue to say at every meeting, I think, Donna can correct me if I'm wrong, is this building's designed for 50 years, right? I don't know what our programs are going to look like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, probably 10 years from now, right? Kids' needs are going to evolve and we'll have to see that. Am I making commitment that there'll never be a specialized program of Crocker Farm? Absolutely not. Uh, I think we're going to have to see how this works and specialized programs have shifted schools in our district before unrelated to building practice based on what, what, what people then in charge felt like was uh, in the best interest of kids. So I think that door, you know, is still something that we should be continue. We need to continually be assessing over time. Um, I think it's just not something in my opinion that we need to bake into an explicit building project right now, because, you know, with 375 kids and 18 classes at Crocker farm, it's going to be, you know, it, you know, 18 classes now, it's busy, right? And so we want to be realistic about space. And, you know, I think to Derek's larger point, something that uh, I'm, I'm also prone to say is we can't think about Crocker Farm in terms of the capital needs there as well. That we, what we don't want to have is kind of repeating the errors of the past where a new school gets done and the other schools get ignored until they have like a major infrastructure project. Um, that Crocker Farm does has ongoing needs that do affect the accessibility of students. You know, we have an ADA report from three years ago. We just talked about that in Pelham, actually, our progress towards it, um, that, that continues to need to evolve and support students because there will be students with special needs at Crocker Farm, a significant quantity throughout time. So um, appreciate the conversation and thanks for bringing it up, Heather. Mike, I just want to make sure we say that we're talking 23 classes at Crocker Farm because when you add the five preschool classes, right. the number goes up by another 50 or 60. So it's, it's a fairly. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Hi, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so my question is, uh, I guess, from a much higher, higher level, looking at these 18 slides of, I guess, functional aspects of design and and, they, and all those schools look so spacious and so well lit. And I'm thinking, how big is this building going to be? <laughs> Or how big does it need to be or can it be given our enrollment sizes? And is there any possibility that we would need a, uh, a two-story building to, to um, make all the space that we need in the different kinds of space? And if it's not, if there's still one going to be one-story buildings, are will they be significantly expanding in the site, or is it just too soon to, to say? That? Well, no, no, thank you. And you know, it it is going to be a relatively large school. Um, the square footage we're we're still navigating right now. Um, the Mass School Building Authority (MSBA) what will weigh in on what spaces are absolutely necessary, what aren't, they have guidelines. Um, 
for example, a classroom somewhere between 900 and 1,000 square feet and art rooms 1,000, right? So they kind of keep us in check on what's an appropriate square footage for spaces. Um, so you're not just building a Taj Mahal, right? So that, that you're really utilizing the money for educational purposes. So, so that's great. Um, what, what we, and so once we have the educational program and understand the needs, special ed plays a, a large part in that. So once we understand all of those programmatic needs, MSBA will say, well, the overall square footage of your building can only be 1.5 um, kind of, it's called grossing factor above and beyond your educational program needs. And so we need to stay within that. So we need to design a very efficient building, regardless of how big it is or, or how many classrooms you need or a program space you need. We can safely say um, either site, it's not gonna matter. You don't have swing space for the students, right? So you're going to have to build the new school or renovate and expand the school, how, what, however it's gonna play out um, while the other school is in existence. So when you start peeling back the layers and of, of the site and all of the site constraints, et cetera, et cetera, um, and taking into consideration wanting outdoor learning spaces, et cetera, that I can safely say it's definitely gonna be at least a two-story building. Um, but that isn't, it's funny, I was talking to David, you know, at Danisco, we've designed I don't know, I feel like hundreds of schools. I cannot recall a school that we've designed that was a single story school, right? Um, outdoor space is so important for so many other reasons that um, putting a footprint of a very large building is probably not the best use of space. And we've learned that the travel time on an 80,000 square foot building that you currently have actually it takes longer on a single story than if it's vertical. So the kids, it actually is quicker to traverse through a school if it's actually on two stories. So the time on learning, we always look at and make sure that we maximize the classroom spaces. Um, so that's our current thinking. Uh, right now we have investigated the sites understanding where we can build Fort River, as you know, or maybe you don't know, um, has some wetlands and some other complications. If we're doing net zero, we're looking at, is it gonna be a geothermal system or is it gonna be VRF? If it's geothermal, we're gonna even need more land to, to put the ground source heat pump. So uh, we're starting to learn and uh, understand all the site attributes and constraints, which will then help us inform how many stories the building needs to be. But I can probably safely say it's gonna be more than one story. That helps, sorry. I guess I can't be succinct either. <laughs> no, no, that's great, thank you, thank you. My daughter's first school was three stories. It was quite compact and it was great. Yeah, we obviously we, needed functioning elevators at all times. Yeah, anything. you're going to need a functioning elevator on two stories, right? Right. So, um, but that is really insignificant when you look at the other aspects. Uh, it's a smaller footprint. It's more compact. You don't need as much as many footings. You can go up. So there are really a lot of benefits to a, a multiple story facility. Um, you have actually land. It's, a, it's not common that you actually have land that you can build on. We just, one of the images in this presentation was the Cabot School in Newton um, and Angel School. I, we had less than two acres and we had 485 kids that needed to be housed. And it was a three-story school. It, you just, there, there was just no other way to accommodate all of the program needs and the outdoor needs. And don't forget about parking, right? So <laughs> that's a whole nother layer of complexity when we do this. But yeah, I think um, it's rare that we've seen, actually, I was talking to David earlier, and I think he was saying that he, most of the schools that he's been involved with as well have been multiple stories as well, three. But 
Hi, Tony. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm just thinking when you mentioned the three stories, you'll have a smaller roof space on which to put photovoltaic panels. Have you a sense yet of how much space the panels will, well, I guess you don't because you don't know how much energy the building design is going to need, but if there's some sort of, um, if there's a need for a significant array that will not fit on the roof of the building and perhaps not on the parking lot, you know, if there's canopies over the parking lot, have you seen using some sort of shelter for outdoor classrooms, like maybe out in the fields that could also hold solar panels? So maybe it's, you know, open on all sides and it's there for the elements, you know, protection from snow and sun and rain, but it could have solar panel, you know, dual purpose. Um, yeah, thank have you. Have you done that? Um, well, we're, so we just completed a school in um, Lexington and it's net zero. And it was a large school, 645 students, three stories. We were able to provide enough um, PVs or solar panels between the parking lot and the roof structure for it to be a net zero. That's depending on how many parking spaces you need, right? So, so we haven't even gotten to that level yet, but if, that isn't sufficient. Yes, there, there are other ways to look at it. There's even, you can even do a structure or a light structure, I should say, over the mechanical equipment to take advantage of, of the rooftop space as well. So we haven't right determined the gross square footage of the building to understand what the, you know, how much energy you need to determine how many PVs, but um, we're going to have to, if if needed, we will be as creative as we need to be to make this a uh, net zero. Thanks. I think we have a couple of folks that were here that maybe joined us from the breakout rooms. Yeah, we've we've still got two breakout rooms in session. I told them that we'd come back in uh, in two two minutes now, eight thirty five. Hi there, I have a question. Hi, this is Jennifer Shaw. I'm a school committee member, and I received a letter from a constituent who, and this is maybe a silly question, but who asked about central air conditioning in the building. Um, give, and she said, given global warming and temperatures rising and that we're trying to get, make a building that's gonna last for 50 years. Um, maybe this is silly and a question in New England, but like, have you worked on new construction of schools in Massachusetts that have central air? Is it an option? It, it actually, let me say it differently. It's really not an option. We build with air conditioning. So, um, so, so to say it differently, right? Um, you will have air conditioning. And so, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Great, good to know, thank you. This is a building that will absolutely be utilized year round. I mean, there's no question about it. And as everyone knows, the shoulder months are getting longer and longer and the need for air and um, yeah, the systems now provide air conditioning that just, just makes the most sense. Fantastic. That was an easy one. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Hi, Tiffany and Clem. Hi. Hi there. Um, so my husband and I have seven kids. Um, five are done with the Amherst schools, gone, doing their own thing, gamefully employed, all good. Um, we have a senior in high school, so this won't be applicable to him, but we have a four-year-old as well. Um, so she'll be in kindergarten in the fall of 23. And so we're just plugging back in. And I guess we're curious about the, um, and it's probably a dumb question. We're curious about sort of the, um, the process in terms of when does this get finalized? So how, how do all the design ideas come together and, and get finalized? And then um, our other question was, as design ideas are proposed, are there also financials to match those design ideas? Not so much for the build, that's not our main concern, but again, having had kids already go all the way through, our concern is maintenance and being able to have those costs built into town budget for, for example, the beautiful idea of having display 
of electronic work that children are doing, because they do so much of it now, in built-in screens and walls as you enter a beautiful building. That's awesome until the screens don't work and we don't have money in the budget to fix them. So just curious about whether or not the budgetary piece backs up the design ideas. So I'll take, I guess, the first, the first part. Um, we are in the feasibility stage right now, feasibility study stage. So we will be looking at all of the options between now and June, and then we will have a decision on which concept or um, option that we want to then pursue, which will occur during schematic design. At that time during schematic design, um, it's, it's pretty robust. We will design the building, the site, all of the attributes of both so that when we bring it forward to the Mass School Building Authority, we know how much the building and the project is going to cost the town. And at that point, that's when the town will be re, um, having the um, votes to have the project proceed. As part of the design process, we will meet with the facilities folks um, and Mike and his team to ensure that not only are the walls gonna be durable, not only can the floors be maintained in the most simplest ways, but you're right, um, facilities are very complex, can be very complex. And so we don't wanna design something that cannot be supported, whether it's mechanical equipment or you know, some fancy uh, displays that no one knows how to operate or whatever. So we will be working with Mike and his team to make sure that everything that we're doing is um, understandable, is easy, and they have the staff or the training will be there for them. Um, Mike, do you wanna talk about the operating budget? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. Um, one is, I think it's a great question. It's one that comes up a lot. We have two members of our facilities uh, department, um, Rupert Roy Clark and Ben Harrington are on the building committee. I can tell you that every meeting, either during it or after when they find me, they're always thinking about the operational costs um, and exactly the question you, you asked, not just the financial impact, but the management impact of, of different technologies in use. But, but I think in terms of the financial piece, I think that our current buildings, this is what I wanna perhaps share is that we're always retrofitting, right? We're always trying to figure out how to introduce technology in spaces that we're not designed for technology. So from a, from a financial aspect, from an operational aspect, I actually think there's really advantages uh, that'll come from having schools that are designed for 21st century technology. Uh, the reality is two of our schools were not really well designed when they were built for 1970s technology. And so we do, we're very inefficient. I'll be honest with you with some of the things that we have to do to make sure that our students do have access to technology in the room. So, you know, I, I actually think that, you know, with smarter design principles, we could see some long-term operational savings. Um, again, can't project 50 years forward, but, you know, at the, in, the, in the short run, uh, not just because we have newer technologies, but actually they'll be, they'll be designed for, they'll be in spaces that are designed to have them and hold them instead of you know, building what we have now where we'll do like you know, large screen TVs because we don't really have the setup for Mimeo boards in, in, in the best way. And then where they are in the room is sort of ill-designed. So we have to put everything on wheels and all of those things. We may want to maintain some of those aspects, but right now retrofitting generally is, is not cheap, right? We're, we're trying to taking an existing product and round peg square hole kind of thing. I'm always mess up expressions. I probably mess up that one. So. Um, so I think it's the right thing to be thinking about the long-term operational costs. And I think that's true on the technology, but it's also true in terms of everything about the building. We want it to be five years from now, no matter different people may be running different parts of the building, we want it to be understandable, usable uh, for folks. And so that we can look at long-term efficiencies and cost savings uh, that come from better technology and better design in our schools. So sorry, long-winded, but but I think it's it's right on. But it's something that I know if I ever forget about it, Ben and Rupert are always uh, reminding me of that, both from the financial but the operational aspects as well. It's really helpful to have them on the committee. Great, thank you both. So I just want to welcome everyone back from their small groups. Um, 
we'll definitely be talking to your group leaders and, and checking in with them about, about your comments and ideas, uh, either regarding the design patterns uh, that we reviewed with you or any other issues that you brought up. Um, just as a time check-in, it's 8.40 right now. Um, I do have one closing activity that's a five-minute activity um, for uh, that is around blue sky ideas and asking you to share some of your aspirational blue sky ideas for this project. Um, but we also have time to continue, I think, um, taking a few more questions if people, if people have them at this point. I guess, um, David, I would just like to say that we have another I think you mentioned at the very beginning that we do have another uh, educational visioning workshop, but we also have a community forum that won't be focused as much on the educational aspects, but on the overall project, talking about um, what the criteria are and your priorities are for the overall project. We'll be talking about sustainability and what we've learned to date on both buildings and both sites. So that is February 3rd, uh, if anyone wants to join us. And I think all of that information's on the project website. And that's, and that's from 6.30 to 9. Correct. February 3rd. Yep. Yeah. Tony, you had your, your hand up? Yeah, just uh, before we move off the, the educational aspect, you showed some really great things about Innovation Hub, STEM, STEAM rooms, and you mentioned how the MSBA Space Summary includes uh, like a science engineering tech room. Mm -hmm. Has there been some thought into how that builds into the schedule? So right now, as you probably are well aware, the students have 40 minutes of five different specials one day a week. One of them is technology. Is the idea that that would be replaced by this innovation hub, makerspace, science, STEM, or would it be part of library class or would it be an addition to the schedule? And if so, what would it replace? How, how does that fit into the, the actual day of, a, of the students? Thanks. Mike? Yeah, I mean, you certainly can jump in, but I know from talking to other superintendents, different schools have used it differently. Some schools use it as sort of a science lab that particularly at the upper grade levels, but not exclusively, students kind of are able to do different kind of science and technology lessons that aren't necessarily possible in traditional classroom settings. Some use it uh, more as you describe as kind of where technology and that that specials class meets and I've talked to some superintendents where it's a hybrid where it is a multi use space where there are, sometimes students might go there for specials but it's also available at certain times a day for classroom teachers who want to get more involved in their stem curriculum. Uh, because of the nature of what's in the room, so I think the sky's the limit uh, and I think it, it's going to be a conversation with our talented staff about what makes sense over time. Um, but David, you know, and Donna, you certainly can jump in. I just know it's a, it's a conversation yeah. I've certainly had with other folks who have been through the MSBA process. Yeah. Well, I would just say, um, you know, to Michael's point that we're designing a building that's going to last for decades to come. We don't know how things are going to evolve. So um, certainly having that kind of larger space that has um, furniture that allows for some real hands-on work and project-based delivery is, is, is something that a lot of schools find attractive. And they may not initially know how they're going to fit it into their schedule. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that we're looking at classrooms themselves as being like maker spaces, maker classrooms. So we're looking at classrooms as being robust enough in terms of technology, in terms of flexible furniture and storage and sinks in every classroom um, and large enough that they can, they can adapt to that, that more hands-on approach because Many schools are are in really they're they're talking a lot about project based learning. It's and that's nothing new, right? I mean, we've been doing project based learning a long time, but but they're trying to figure out how that they're, they're drawn to that because it's what engages a wider variety of students, and um, and it's also what connects to their ideas about future ready learning goals. But they haven't necessarily figured out how to uh, how they're implementing it within their school. They're at all different places. Let's just say. Um, so we want to make sure that the classrooms themselves lend themselves to that kind of delivery um, and the spaces in between. It's really, it's really looking at trying to maximize um, the, uh, the looking at scenario planning in such a way that, that 
many spaces can become um, can adapt to delivery of something like a like a like a STEM or a STEAM program. Other questions? We know it's been a long day for uh, for for all of us. Um, if there are no other questions at this point, we could move into uh, just a, a closing activity. Um, does that sound good? All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here one more time. So um, this is a, a sort of a brainstorm for what your blue sky ideas are for you know the school, for the sort of uh, amenities within it, qualities of the school. Um, it's not like we want to get you frustrated about what's what's not possible or promote you know kind of like lots of spending that's unnecessary but blue sky ideas are really to try and encourage people to think creatively and aspirationally about what you would love to see um, happen uh, within your schools the kind of programming uh, or or the kind of affordances of spaces so um so just thinking about um, a blue, it could be a blue sky idea for something like a sculpture garden or, you know, for, or for a maker space or a space that you can imagine um, if you're a teacher or you're a parent, um, uh, your, your children um, uh, really getting a lot out of. So thinking about that in terms of size, shape, color, furniture, lighting, anything you want to kind of describe to us. And so I'll just open up um, for you to share your blue sky ideas here. And this will be our exit ticket. So um, feel free to uh, to to leave once you've um, once you have uh, um, given us your ideas. You can submit more than one. There's I think there's a 250 character limit. So if you get cut off, you can just send another one in. Um, but certainly um, share with us uh, to your heart's content uh, whatever whatever you'd be most excited about. Um, and I guess I'll just say also, if people do have other questions, um, you know, we're here. So just ask us um, now, or if you have additional thoughts, um, uh, I actually have a, a, a slide with uh, Debbie Westmoreland's. Um, Michael, could you, could you maybe put that in the chat, uh, Debbie's email? She's our point person for taking additional comments um, as you're thinking about this at greater length. And if anyone wants to turn off their mic and share your blue sky idea, feel free to do that as well. And for those people that are uh, leaving, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and we'll look forward to uh, future, future meetings and carrying on the conversation. I like the roller skate rental one. <laughs> no shortage of ideas here. And really nothing that looks too out of out of out of the realm of possibility. In the spirit of blue sky, I will suggest that when I asked my six year old or sorry, nine year old gosh, he grows fast. Um, what he wanted, he said he wanted a, a swimming school where water slides take you into your classrooms and there's a lap pool and like a water polo area in the classrooms. So how's that for blue sky? That is <laughs> An aqua school. <laughs> that, that, yes, that's amazing. 
Well, I, I would like to say that we love engaging the kids and their creativity and even at this age, right? What, what they think is possible, but we, we will um, engage them or work with the schools to engage them, uh, go to the schools as they learn about how a building comes together. Or how do you put a playground together? Or what would you like to see on the playground? Like that, that's real. Like, like th those comments and thoughts are really yeah. helpful throughout yeah. the design process. I don't so. know if people have seen this book here. I mean, is it, uh, I don't know if you're able to see it on my it's, screen. It's a little blurry. Yeah, it's a little blurry. I don't understand why. Because you're blurring oh, oh, it's because I, You know, it's because I have that blur on the back. I'm going to take that off. Hold on. And then you're going to be able to see it. Choose virtual. Okay, so here we go. If I built a school, this is a great book for kids to be thinking about all, you know, fantasizing about what they'd like to see in a school, but also engaging them in a conversation about what are the things that we need to be thinking about. And they have great, great feedback. Oh, yes. Yes, Anastasia says you love that book. That's great. All right. Well, we're going to be putting all these together um, as a set of consolidated notes uh, that connect also to um, other conversations, the continuing conversation that we're having. Uh, we're going to make it available on the project website. And um, again, thank you very much for, for coming. Oh, yes, yeah, someone mentioned the book, The Third Teacher, which is another great book. Yeah, Thanks I really like it. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I can hold it up. Good. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's I got, a really I got neat it on my back on my bookshelf right back here, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, every now and then I just pull it out because it just makes me think a little bit differently about uh, where things can be, even in, in our current context. But it's, um, it's yeah. the third teacher, 79 ways you can use design to transform teaching and learning. Um, but really neat images. It gets to some of the comments that were before about, you know, there's a section describing some special needs and accessibility, um, all sorts of play. You know, there was no, no water slides that I saw, but there were um, slides and different play activities and, and ways to get around the building. So uh, it's a fun read if anyone's interested. And, you know, I have a copy. If anyone wants to borrow it, they're welcome to just reach out to me. Happy to lend it out. Thanks, Mike. All right. Bye, everyone. All right. Everyone. Night, night, night. Night. See you all. Good night, everyone. Thank night. you.